Awesome. All right. Well, I will go ahead and get us kicked off. Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the ninth annual MIT Water Summit. Uh, we had our first day yesterday uh, in person, and we're excited to host this virtual portion of the conference to continue learning about and discussing uh, the unique challenges facing coastal cities and ecosystems by investigating the balance between the built and natural environment. But for first, for those of you who weren't able to attend yesterday, we'd like to introduce you to who we are and what we do. Um, so my name is Kristen Reidinger. I am the current president of MIT Water Club. Um, MIT Water Club is a group of students that are passionate about water issues, working together with stakeholders from industry, academia, finance, policy, nonprofits, artists, and pretty much anyone else who's interested in working together to solve the world's water challenges. We host a few main events at MIT each year. The first one is the summit. The second is the Water Innovation Prize, our startup pitch competition, which is launching tonight, uh, immediately after uh, the end of this event on that same Zoom webinar link. The third event is MIT Water Night. Uh, that's our research expo and community engagement night, where we display water-related research posters, art, and educational demos in order to educate academics, community members, and anyone else who's interested in what's going on in the world of water. Our newest event uh, this year is the MIT Hackathon, which will be a time for students to dive deep into a water-related problem over the course of 24 hours to come up with new innovative solutions to these pressing challenges. We also do some smaller activities throughout the year, such as hosting a lecture series, working at various MIT offices on on-campus water sustainability projects, and you know, a few other things here and there. Uh, if you have any questions about what we do or want to get involved in any of these activities, we'd love to talk to you. Um, you know, you can feel free to, to reach out to us uh, through our email on, uh, the, you know, on our website and everything. Um, as I mentioned, the Water Summit is the first of our main events. Uh, each year we have a different theme, and in previous years we've talked about issues like the role of water in building resilient systems, plastic pollution, the water food nexus, and urban water challenges. Uh, every year we're amazed at what we learn, the connections we make, and what people are doing to make the world a better place in spite of these big challenges that we're all facing. We've already heard from a ton of wonderful speakers this year, and we're super excited for today's program. And with that, I will hand it over to the Water Summit co-directors, Autumn Dietrich and James Bryce. Hello, everyone. My name is Autumn Dietrich. And uh, my name is James Bryce. Uh, maybe we could just do a quick, uh, make sure everyone gets, gets pinned here. Uh, great. So uh, like Kristen said, uh, we're the co-directors of this year's MIT Water Summit, Coastal Cities and Ecosystems. More than 40% of the world's population lives within 60 miles of a coastline. With this theme, we wanted to explore the issues, challenges, and solutions related to sustaining coastal communities and ecosystems such as mangrove forests, seagrass meadows, and salt marshes. Given increasing concerns over sea level rise, more frequent and intense coastal disasters and the impact of climate change on our coastal ecosystems, it's no doubt that the theme of this year's summit is incredibly timely. As an issue spanning across disciplines and affecting countless human and non-human communities, the conversation surrounding restoration, resilience, and adaptation of the coastline requires a truly multidisciplinary perspective. We have a great lineup of speakers here today uh, representing experts from various fields, engineering, science, policy, planning, design, journalism, you know, the list goes on, as uh, Kristen mentioned. And so we hope through these talks and presentations to highlight some of the amazing work and conversation happening around coastal cities and ecosystems and the importance of cross-disciplinary collaboration in the face of global climate change. So it should be an exciting second day. Uh, we hope you're going to enjoy it. Awesome. Thanks, James. And before we get um, fully started and deeper into the program, we'd like to take a minute to introduce our Water Summit team and to thank all of our sponsors. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Awesome. Can you see everything well, James? Yeah. Cool. So we have Adrian Garcia and Nikki Buer. 
kind of doesn't want to advance. Let me go down here. There we go. Laura Chen and Lai Wa Chu. Aditya Godgunkar and Ippoliti Delatola. Benjamin Tiger, Elena Perez. Bella Carmelita Carriker and Ekapog Nguantapan. And we'd also like to thank our uh, sponsors, the Sapphire Tier, Aquamarine, Aquamarine. and then Turquoise. And so um, at this time, we'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Kachakorn Vorakom is a landscape architect from Thailand who works on building productive green spaces at, that tackle climate change in urban dense areas and vulnerable communities. So we're super excited. She created the first critical green infrastructure for uh, Bangkok, the Chulalong Corn Sanitary Park. Her complete design works also include Tamasa Urban Farm Rooftop, a 36 acre, acre urban farm rooftop featuring the biggest urban farming green roof in Asia, and the first bridge park across the river in any world capital, Chow Phra Sky Park. Morocco uh, was awarded the UN Climate Change for winners of the 2020 UN Global Climate Action Awards. Women for Results, she was featured in the 2019 Time 100 Next list, one of 15 leading women fighting against climate change from Time Magazine, BBC 100 Women 2020, and the Green 30 for 2020 by Bloomberg. She is chairwoman of the Climate Change Working Group of the International Federation of Landscape Architects. Barakram received her master's in landscape architecture from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design and taught there as a design critic in spring 2020. Currently, she's also a TED Fellow and Echoing Green Fellow. So without further ado, we'd like to hand things over to Kasha Korn. Hi, everyone. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. So thank you, Kristen. Thank you, James. Thank you, Adam, for, for having me today. And thank you, MIT um, and all the audience. So let me start my presentation by sharing screen. Um, yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. So I'm actually here in Yes. Can you guys hear my screen? Yes, correct? Great. Yep. Okay, good. Um, actually, here in- A new industrial revolution. London, I'm actually just came back from COP26, where is all the world leader was gathered and talking about the climate change. And I think the MIT Water Summit is just like, um, the water is a really core to the climate impact in many countries. So before I'm getting into my work, I would like to share my experience from the COP26 and how's, how's the world leading us to solutions or any solutions. Let's start with the opening remark by Sir David Attenborough, which um, really just have one sentence. <laughs> Um, speaking in the clip video that he's sharing, let's start with this. Powered by millions of sustainable innovations is essential and is indeed already beginning. We will all share in the benefits, affordable clean energy, healthy air, and enough food to sustain us all. Nature is a key ally. Wherever we restore the wild, it will recapture carbon and help us bring back balance to our planet. And as we work to build a better world, we must acknowledge 
no nation has completed its development because no advanced nation is yet sustainable. All have a journey still to compete so that all nations have a good standard of living and a modest footprint. We're going to have to learn together how to achieve this, ensuring none are left behind. We must use this opportunity to create a more equal world. And our motivation should not be fear, but hope. Can we fix climate problem in one generation? My answer would be yes, we have to. We need to not just to talk about what we can do, but to do what we can. This is a challenge that we should try to solve in a quick way with the long-term vision. It comes down to this. The people alive now are the generation to come. will look at this conference and consider one thing. Did that number stop rising and start to drop as a result of commitments made here? There's every reason to believe that the answer can be yes. If working apart, we are force powerful enough to destabilize our planet, surely working together, we are powerful enough to save it. In my lifetime, I've witnessed a terrible decline. In yours, you could and should witness a wonderful recovery. That desperate hope, ladies and gentlemen, delicate, excellency, is why the world is looking to you and why you are here. Thank you. So yes, it's quite a really um, powerful opening for this UNCOP26. And I feel that um, it's actually every country still need, still have a journey to, to come. And today I will share with you um, the journey. I'm actually gonna speak for 20 minutes and maybe I would break a little bit for our Q&A. So, yes, I'm actually part of the COP26 because last year I was awarded as a um, um, first female Asian woman in the COP26. And I was so glad that um, the built profession was actually there for this award and, and especially for the landscape architects. It's called UN Global Climate Action Award. Um, so this year, last year was all online with the pandemic, so it was really crazy. So this year, they invite us all back to give a presentation at the COP26. And yes, I was really honored and be part of that um, powerful opening of Sir David Timbra. Um, for this COP26, there are also um, call out from the profession, engineer, architect, landscape architects, to really aim for the net zero emission in 2040. So it's not only the work of nations, but it's also the work of our profession. At MIT or Harvard Design School, we are talking about um, cities, the bigger environment, and we are part of solution we are part of the problem as well so if we don't start i think um, we cannot just rely on the policy but we have to really rely on what we can do all the engineer architects landscape architects urban design and i actually have a chance to meet met many to meet many important people around water issues including uh, mr hank which is like um, the envoy, a special envoy for the water um, issues in Netherlands. And we really like need to combine the solution together. It's not about copying the solution from one nation to another, but it's about learning the process. And I also, this is 
Presenting my work, also taught um, um, before the semester of the COVID at GSD Harvard, and also, yeah, this is like consider a country, and this is um, the wetland, and how could the wetland is actually absorb more carbon than the forest? And we are talking about. Coastal ecology, which in between the fresh water and the marine ecology, and at the edge um, of these two ecology is mostly a delta um, landscape, and that many delta, that many mangrove, that many wetlands are the location of the city like Bangkok. So we actually built. Um, 20 million people city on top of the muddy river delta and on top of the wetland and without thinking so much about water uh, and you can see the sea is there the river is here and this is this is swamp so when we um also look to the age of the ocean we can see no more mango, only the shrimp farm. So I think this is such a big problem when it's come to, we even destroy our own barriers to protect from the sea level rise. And because the water is actually coming from all directions when it's come to Delta City, it's either from the watershed, it's either from the rain, is either from the sea and also I think that another direction is the underground water. So there are so many um, solutions that we only can only think about hard engineer infrastructure like dams and this is how the city normally is in the rainy season. So you, it's more expensive to to recycle all these things. So you are exporting all these things in to let's say Thailand and many Southeast Asian country. And we are on the list of um, the cost of towing all this waste. It's 
actually not only is this trash from ties, but they're actually trash from people around the world. Which is really sad and fair. So, water is not just water as a city, um, plus ecology. But it's also become politics, policy, solutions, um, disaster, and many, many more. So I think we're actually at the point that we either adapt or die. Um, let me um, share the end with the, with the sound. And please feel free to have any questions on the chat. <laughs> During the high tide, for example, the, the sea level is already higher than Bangkok. Uh, Bangkok has situated on the soft clay and there are layer of clay, sand, clay and sand. We don't have any rock layer. Some area, especially Bangkapi area, has been sunk for one meter already. We don't concern much about our natural waterways, which is canal. So that's is that's mean we neglect about how the water will drain. This is part of the solution that can be replica in other city or in within the city that we need more space, more place to hold the water. very more action oriented rather than just keep all this research of climate change with, with on the shelf. So the policy maker or the community have to come together. It's a good start, but it's not definitely not enough. Yeah, so actually I want to say architects of definitely working with um, the team of engineers, architects, um, of the design, and we actually finish um, Chula Lumpur Centenary Park, which is the first park 
in 30 years of Bangkok. The first big park, yes. So this is a um, new park. You can see the these kind of flat um, cities with no place, no room for water. And this is the park, first green piece of um, that uh, mention about green infrastructure in the city. So as we are so flat, we incline the whole park. So the whole park would have um, the place is just high and it's low, and then the, the water can kind of like flood in the park and be equipped with the green water tank underneath this park with architectures. And we, after the run runoff coming down to the wetland, that is a wetland to help clean the runoff. Going to the retention pond where people can paddling and be part of the water experience. Um, so it's got um when it's in decline, it's not only just for water, but it's also thinking about the park function. So this is not just the park that we understand is a park, but it's a retention pond, retention park that helps the city. And in Thailand, we have the concept of monkey sheep. So Right when the, the the monkey have um eat and it store its food in the sheath and when it's hungry it just eat it whenever it want. So with the sea of concrete city, we actually need a room for water. And we if we could not provide a room for water, as we understand, we should use every space in the buildings every drops of rain counts. And I was so honored that Mr. Antonio Guterres, kind of like um, number one figure when it's come to climate change, came to the park for giving a big support for this local solution. Second one is um, water is everything, right? Water is food, water is, and especially the fresh water. I think when if the temp the temperature if if we fail, um, how old are you if we fail to meet this zero um carbon emission in two thousand thirty? How old are you guys? And how old are you guys if we fail again in two thousand fifty? We actually should be the generation to recover all this thing. So this is a mission that we should work. Um, on it together through food, through water. And we know that eating more meat is actually spoiled our ecology. So the plant-based um, food is actually part of this. And this is uh, another solution. Biggest urban rooftop farm in Asia, um, probably um, top three in the world for the single building. And you can see that all the buildings can be part of the solution. It not necessarily have to be the waste space on top of the rooftop and many and many more, creating urban heat island and things. 
So this is the mimic of the nature-based solution that farmers used to do when they're living in the mountainous areas to slow down runoff. This building slowed down runoff 20 times. And also using the gravity to this runoff and grow food for the campus. So this is um, the, the construction of this. And I think this can be a um, replica in many buildings that still left unused of the rooftop areas or the new building. And it should be the place for food because you actually, this building helping us reduce water footprint and also helping us having an organic food. We eat so much pesticides, exporting from Monsanto, the US, and we got so much disease like cancer and things. So this is a young generation. Maybe in 10 years, they would be in their 30s, but they should know how to grow their own food. And they should know that this is possible in Thailand, in the agriculture country. So this building also equipped with um, the solar roof and then um, pumping through the solar roof, the water up and then drain it through the gravity. And to doing that, you get food and you get retention pond, like a monkey sheet to hold this water. And it's 20 times runoff velocity. So if normally you'd flood in five minutes, it's gonna slow down your flooding problem into a hundred minutes. It's also addressed the um, public space. And yes. So I'm gonna go to another solution and I'm gonna open a little bit for Q&A before we move into the working with the water vulnerable community. So this building is actually been named as a year award last year from Architizer, which is, I'm very honored. It's like the big um, online platform for architects profession to really recognize that we should work together. And Vulnerable Sustainability Prize is actually got the, got the top award. And this is another one that I work with um, Governor of Bangkok with the urban design, with the architects in Thai and with the engineer in Thailand. We actually um, changed the left unused infrastructure in the middle of the city that left unused for 40 years to become the first public park across the river in any capital and link to park on the both sides of the river. And it is so narrow, we shifted into the park that is on the bridge that's kind of um, helping people to walk and be access to the riverfront in a different way. Low carbon city is part of the things that we should work on as well as, as a city of water. Um, Hong Kong is actually um, the Delta city and we're actually sinking faster than the sea level rise for towns. So while I were initiative that talking, helping containing the runoff and then the water is actually also helping the city. And there are so many rooftop from the unused hairy pad turning into the healing garden and using the waste, I think, Definitely we're talking about water, but touch all the aspect of food. This is the urban farm rooftop. We use the water in the buildings and also the runoff from, from the building. So I'm, after this clip video, I'm just gonna take Q and A for five minutes. We are at the point of risking our life living in the city. Sadika, my name is Kochkar Mara Akom. I'm a landscape architect from Bangkok, Thailand. The Chulalongkorn Centenary Park, that was my first public park 
and I feel so proud of this project. For Chula, we actually just inclined the whole park. It's so simple that we call it gravity. And we're actually using the whole park to collect every drop of rain. When we change into Thomasat University project, we are using the same concept of gravity because it's the cheapest technology that we can find on Earth. But for Thomasat University rooftop, we're actually using the rice terraces to slow down the runoff to really help to grow food. My inspiration of my design and being a landscape architect is nature. And I think there is so much to learn. It's not only just the form and then the color and its beauty, but it is also its function. How can we mimic those kind of functions to really be part of how we create our city? Bangkok is in ranking of one of the most at-risk city of climate change. And I just feel that we are fighting with water in many directions. The rain, the water from the north, the water from the ocean, the sea level rise. I think we're going to sink. But we're going to live with water again. We used to live with water, right? So this flooded canal community, they actually been most affected community during the Great Flood in 2011. Lat Pao Canal is one of the main canals that put all the runoff from the inner city of Bangkok into Japia River. I think they have probably have to be in the flood water for like two to three months, the minimum during that time. Even the seasonal rain get there community to flood. So the government have this policy to widening the canal so the flood water can flow through quickly and they have more capacity to actually contain more water. Yep. But that means the displacement of all the community. In the future, this will be dams and pave, and that area will be canal. Oh, they just moved in like two weeks ago. I really disagree with the dam structure that's gonna pave all the canal in Bangkok. I think it's such a um, bad solution that going to create more problems for us for the future of this city. But so much we can do, we cannot change the national policy. Right now, what we try to do is to help the community negotiate with the government to win this place and then return back to their neighborhood. And for the La Pao Connect community, we actually succeed on doing that. <laughs> you saw that compound, the new, before they live like this. So I um, graduated from Thailand. At that time, I just feel like I want to become a great landscape architect. That's my dream. So I push myself to get a job in the good firms, push myself to go into Harvard. And when I get things done, my checklist dreams, and I just feel like I still feel so empty. I'm lucky to confront with the Great Flood in 2011. And it's really questioning myself, what can you do as a landscape architect? Being resilient is not about being in one stage. It's like you dance with nature. The floods used to be the source of food, the source of fertilization. The changing of the way we live as a city in this past 30 or 50 years we completely turn our back to this natural change and call it disaster. We're working in something so doable, but I think we have to have more people advocate for this and create Bangkok the way we love, not Bangkok the way it is. So yes, um...
Jen, she wanna help me? What is the project that you're currently working on? Can you describe the process taking project from the idea to physical projects? What's better, it is applying the model of Shilong to an apartment park. Is there enough space to create an apartment park to make difference? How do we integrate the carpet solution to the land server fabrics? Um, I think is um the first part is I think um so you're asking about the design inspiration. So I think we need to learn and we need to observe more and talking with the people who live there and who experience the impact of the climate change. I think they're very resilient. The problem is the city that we build is not resilient, but the, we as a human is really resilient. <laughs> so how could we design to help us to shine our ability? Because if Thai people are so amphibious, you don't know how we live in the world. It's just part of our life, but just the city, the street, the road itself is making us fear. So I think the physical projects can be beautiful, nothing hard about that. But to be, um, to relate to the people, to relate to the lifestyle of the future lifestyle, I'm not talking about, about the business as usual lifestyle, but I'm talking about the lifestyle that we should adapt to. I think this is so important. And I don't have exact answer for you. And as a designer myself, each project is actually, I need to find out what's the answer for each one. And working with a lot of team, yes. So what's the barrier? Because um, the, your, your questions and your answers already um, apply. Like it's already, you cannot just rip off the city and then let's do the rainwater tank underneath. This is really impossible because you're moving people, like real people, and in another section, we're going to talk more about that. But I just feel that um, we can apply that, but in different uh, scenarios, let's say, like, every building needs to have a rainwater tank to maintain the runoff, because right now that is, that is called precipitation rate or the rain falling rate. Like let's say the infrastructure in Thailand, not none of them think about this capacity. But for the IPCC report that just came out two like months ago, um, mentioned that yeah we have to think about the rain cycle like hundred years or two hundred years from now when we build a city. But what if our city have to think about that? How can even Chula Long Gone is only fifty years period cycle? Every infrastructure has limitation. So when the pouring rain, the car burst, the car burst, and many other things happen with the pouring rain from the climate change, um, we have to help. So we need to apply right now. Like how can we find a room for rain for water? It's not a sponge city. This is Delta city. We kind of just um, absorb the water because the capacity of the underground water is already like. Um, fully occupied by um, the sea intrusion. So I think we need to think about the rainwater tank or many innovations. So correct, we cannot rip off anything. We have to work on what we have and apply the new um, norms of the climate change into our infrastructure. Okay, so I think I only have 10 minutes left and I'm just gonna move you guys to the ocean now. Quick, quick. Um, great. Okay. So I'm also working not only for the, um, oops, I couldn't move my slide. So I'm not only working for kind of big project with the battery. And you can see is the designer working with the, in a big project, but it's still a project as a system there are there must be something really difficult about the policy and yes we are moving to find to connect all this solution together and this is um vulnerable community that we work with 
I'm Andrew and I'm trying to answer your question later on, but let me finish um, the presentation quickly. So, so with the um, climate, um, with the water issues, I know you guys are focusing on sea level, so let's move to on the air side. So, now, The science keep architect, but finding the housing for reduce the displacement of the people, working with like facilities that will help them endure with the flooding. These people have no choice. Um, Bangkok, the whole city, are a vulnerable community, but there are more vulnerable people in that community. So reducing and the new project, um, we working. We have like. We used to have almost 400 canals in the city. Right now, we have only 100 something left over. That's why it's flooding, right? And now, uh, working with the governor of Bangkok, Aswin Khuat Mương, we actually gonna turn the first canal. Oh my gosh, first canal in Bangkok into the public space, and it's, this is right the canal in CBD, and you it's gonna finish at the end of this year and the first facing so i hope to come back and share with all this turning the sewage canal into a clean water and a public space and then this is the coastal community this is another big problem So people start to build into the ocean.
part of Thailand, you cannot move in line because it's Cambodia and it's so much like bomb trap and people are just swimming in the oceans. And they actually like, this is really common problem in 7,000 7, fishermen village in, Tha in the coast of Thailand. So when we talk about water, we talk about sea level rise, but you really have to see and understand these people who politically not legal to live in the ocean because it's the land of the government and mostly are women because the fishermen village, the guys go out and work. And you actually have um, opportunity to talk to them and working with them. And this is um, our um, advisor consultant, Professor Dr. This is the project that he tried to see, like break the, the sea wave, um, the ocean erosion. So this is um, the structure. This is very engineer based. It's just like, how can we break the water so we can grow the mangrove and then the mangrove can like be part of the carbon budget and it's create an income. And if you want to live legally, you help um, government build mangrove, which they need anyway. So there's so many like um interplay. So this is the reality. Not that we built this. This is um studies that this kind of structure will help reduce um the strength of the wave. So we using um Professor Tanawat models to try to work at the heart like. Um, community working with um, younger designer, understand the wave and try to um, study this, how could we apply the structure and, but only the structure is engineer. What with the mangrove is become, for me, it's become nature-based solution. So how can we finding the right solution? and trying to keep the fish tradition, the fisherman tradition, the sustained one, not the big commercial one, and trying the first fate of growing the mangrove with the community, with the righteous to, to stay here. And we have so much inland floodplain talking about them. This is what before and after impact. So we kind of against them that, is this is are you sure you want it of lifestyle? Are you afraid of water that much that you built this thing and you have to live all like <laughs> forever with this? But you actually just just flood both sides. What's the point of the dams? So yes, I think my time is running out. Hi James. Hi. Well, no, it's okay. You gave a great presentation. Um, and I think you did touch on uh, some of uh, these questions, but maybe if you want to take another uh, just couple minutes to elaborate on uh, on the, some of the questions in the chat. Yes. Um, do you have a question? Oh, my God. Okay. Um, share this and writers is actually also practiced in many parts of the world but I'm sure there are some techniques and also um we use to live on stilt because it's flood anyway it's flood anyway in Delta City because of the watershed is actually transformed the water into the ocean but in the past the wisdom of how we live with the water Thai architecture have still right if you could find a picture why could we build a whole city on still the still city so when it's flood the whole flood go through and we live in the upper level so i think all this technique should be applied and learning from the past to imply the future don't go into the future without knowing who you are or your past yes that's uh, my answer from the last questions.
Any more questions? I maybe I have one quick one if hey, we could great. just have another second. Um, but I, I it was really great to see sort of the the way that the the community you, you, there was like a kind of like one shot where you were talking about co-creating the spaces with the community. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about that process and like how the community is uh, very directly involved in design decisions? Yeah, I think you you have to ask those who use the space, right? And this is like really bottom up. And when I go to the COP26, it's really top down. <laughs> so the whole one is talking like the Bidens and um, all of these world leaders and really like those who impact doesn't have a seat to voice their opinions. And we can be the mediums. And I think, um, really need to understand you could not just do the typical architecture or typical dance or typical engineer solution and apply everywhere you are neglecting the dynamic of ecology so i feel that by understanding the dynamic of ecology you need to talk to people oh my gosh this is not the garbage ocean that we throw down this is from other part of other country maybe so the government really don't understand they say oh these people they are dirty they're illegal they are Thai but they cannot stay in Thailand <laughs> so I just feel that there are so many issues that it's about water but it's about people it's about politics it's about solution and how can we leverage those to not to be a problem but to to make a dialogue between waters so people understand each other more. And the village that we're working with, we can push for the ministry to talk in the UN event. So that's me a little bit looking at to fixing this problem. In terms of the housing, when we are talking about the water, yes. Thank you. Are there uh, any more, maybe any more questions before we wrap things up? Okay. Great, thank you so much for having me. I um, feel so honored to be with you guys. And yeah, let's work together. There's so much issue about waters and we need yeah. to Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like this is a very fitting. And for anyone who was uh, with us yesterday, I feel like it was great to see some of the application of some of the like engineering solutions that we talked about. Um, and really like how it happens on the ground and, and working yeah. from the community. Um, so, yeah, work with landscape architects. Work yeah, please. So, <laughs> so we bring the nature-based solution portion with your innovation together. I think it's even better. Don't just work by yourself. Yes. Absolutely, I agree. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you again, uh, Kachaporn, for an amazing talk uh, for starting off the day. Um, I am gonna hand things over uh, now to Ipolite to Bye. introduce our next feature. Thank you. Bye. Um, James, are we starting now or at 9.30? Hey James, you're muted. Sorry, yeah, so that was a mistake of mine. So yeah, we are gonna take a, a brief break. Thank you. Yep, everyone will be back here at 9.30 on the same uh, webinar link. So see you all soon. Sorry, even staff. It's about 40% uh, vacancies are there. Even if I have certain staff number to do a certain thing, uh, only 40% are there and several times the staff end up doing two, three uh, responsibilities, which is not humanly possible. Uh, just to show you how a typical city is administered in India, there's a million plus city. Uh, uh, 
though they are called local self governments the administration is decided by the state government how many members to be appointed they are funded by the state government uh, cities depend largely on finance from the state governments uh, the tider is determined by the state governments so on and so forth there's very little freedom for the cities to hire and fire their own staff or uh, get on more people as in when they want for certain specific deals so roughly 5800 6000 is a staff for a million plus city uh, sorry uh, yeah million plus city and about 50 to 55% are unskilled uh, semi skilled workers like plumbers masons electricians drivers uh, typists so on and so forth uh, and the departments uh, related to health education fire fighting consume uh, about 25 30% staff so remaining 20% staff is for administration and other purposes including water supply sewerage drainage uh, planning etc there are two three town planners for a city of 1 million people and we don't know how many are actually present and what are their skills it's not only the numbers the skills is also important uh, technology adoption is not much we still follow a little bit oldish technologies in terms of planning uh software is not used data is uh, manually collected so on and so forth uh, and that leads to low levels of service delivery whether it's water supply sewage solid waste uh, i'll come to uh, another important uh, service delivery is storm water drains overall india ranks very low compared to global benchmarks on number of public servant per say 10000 population etc that's an important indicator to say how strong is the public service delivery and uh, governance uh, and that is also very skewed uh, some may be very high in certain departments like railways or postal departments uh, which uh, so that that's a very important point to be considered when you are trying to deal with disasters how do you uh, deal with them and you have low capacities low skills and low numbers and that's something that will continue in future and they are supposed to be dealing with climate change uh, risks and impacts uh, on the other hand we have very inadequate infrastructure it's both uh, an opportunity it's, it's well it's not a good news it's an opportunity when you are building to go for better uh, green infrastructure so you are already accounting into some mistakes that other countries have done in the past and which are more uh, green and climate friendly Uh, for example water supply uh, outdated uh, pipelines etc intermittent water supply none of the cities except barring one or two have 24/7 water supply uh, and a lot of groundwater extraction happens which is depleting the groundwater tables and polluting them also sewerage uh, there are no estimates but several estimates say about 30 to 50% of total sewerage is collected could vary from city to city uh, there may be two three cities which collect more than 90% sewage but again treatment is much less than that so a lot of uh, untreated sewage is flowing into environment natural water bodies uh, etc and they are polluting and even blocking the uh, drains storm water drainage has come to it it's one of the important parameters while you are considering the frequent flooding that we see in urban areas in uh, india whether it's mumbai or chennai or delhi or hyderabad Uh, why does the flooding happen is it all due to uh, climate change and uh, more rainfall or is it due to uh, low level of infrastructure that's available could be both uh, so that's very important uh, even if you have infrastructure the operations and maintenance is again be because it's linked to your capacity it's linked to financing and it is linked to uh, monitoring data uh, so not much is reported on that we don't know how well these things are functioning whatever is in place that's an area that needs improvement and also an opportunity to go green uh, in future just to say how inadequate is the um, storm water drainage uh, this is across 3900 odd cities uh, done by our uh, ministry of housing and urban affairs very recently not much has changed in this so if you look at maharashtra um, or, or any city i mean so the right blue is what you need to look look at the extreme right is that is where cities have more than 75% of storm water drainage across the roads i'm not saying that sufficient uh, or is that enough but at least that is only few cities as you see and the dark red is the cities that do not have uh, storm water drainage which is below 25% 
remaining this 25 percent to 50 percent the orange and light blue is 50 to 75 percent so none of the cities apparently barring one or two have 100 percent from water drainage and for coastal towns is a very important infrastructure requirement to uh, even if there's a slightly higher rainfall than normal how where does it drain out uh, so that's very important even where the uh, sewerage line sorry the the stormwater drains are there they're blocked uh, they're choked with uh, solid waste because that's also not done properly. It's a multiple uh, urban governance issues that are adding to the people's problem uh, that you all frequently say, I haven't put any pictures, the, the flooding that we have when there is a excess rainfall or more than normal rainfall, I won't even call it excess rainfall uh, on an even single day or across two days. Uh, I'm sure the Thailand uh, photos are almost uh, replicable uh, in India, uh, whether it's Mumbai, Chennai, Hyderabad, so on and so forth. So I call it, a lot of us call it, is it a climate change thing or is it a man-made disaster? Uh, so on the right, you see this cartoons. It's the best way that uh, they tell you the problem very in a humorous manner. Uh, they don't put you under tension and blame game is not there. So the, the pilots are distressed. And why did we build this airport on uh, river foot plains? It's, it's Mumbai. Uh, we have built our airport on Miki River flat plains. And the first time when it rains more, our airports get uh, sort of flooded. Uh, so, so there's a cartoon about it. The left is a, uh, Kerala has been another coastal state experiencing heavy floods in the last uh, five, six years. So it, it has come in two, three years and that's leading to landslides and a lot of losses, etc. So they're asking the central government, isn't it your state too? The government is saying, but you know, you did all this uh, deforestation, construction, quarrying, so on and so forth. That's it. So the whole point is how much do we blame climate change and uh, how much do we blame uh, our own inefficient planning or lack of planning and uh, man-made disasters? Uh, that has to be considered uh, as we move forward in urban governance. It's not only the coastal cities. There's another report which says there are many more cities that are uh, getting into flooding, uh, uh, urban floods, if you like. Uh, even cities like Jaipur, which are very low rainfall, New Delhi, uh, low rainfall, Chandigarh, Bhopal, Bangalore, they say uh, lakes are getting uh, filled up and they're becoming uh, habitats, you know, urban residences. Uh, that's the same case. You fill up flood plains, you fill up lakes, you fill up any dam area that you see is empty. You reclaim, see Mumbai, 40 to 50 percent is reclaimed area. You cut off mangroves and then you build city on that. Uh, and then you start saying climate change and you're getting impacted. So that's a scary situation for India. It's not only the coastal towns or cities with high rainfall, but many other cities are uh, on the flood map, uh, flood map of India, not flood zones. So that's why urban governance uh, and policies are very, very important as we move forward. Uh, this is structure for national disaster management. There's a national act, uh, which has come in 2005. Uh, I will not explain itself, it takes a long time. It's a PhD topic in itself. So, but it calls for coordination from central level to state level to district level to city level uh, in the time of uh, disasters. Disasters could be earthquakes, floods, fires, landslides, etc. You have an informed structure for all these. Uh, so, so some people call it, is it a single window approach or many people in the same window? Life is very difficult if there are many people in the same window. And oftentimes we see uh, the response is not uh, up to the desired expectations. But something is there and it's working in extreme uh, disasters and uh, things are improving. Uh, but is that sufficient as we move forward to a, a more scarier situation of uh, climate change impacted uh, uh, crises that are going to hit uh, the coastal cities. What do citizens think? Uh, citizens like me, we have to lead our lives. So the right hand, uh, the bottom corner, uh, bottom uh, cartoon is about India. We know there's urban floodings. We all come together, uh, share food, help each other, get on with the life. Uh, Again, people look to the government, whether it's droughts or whether it's floods, it's the same government which has to respond. And many people across the globe think the whole climate change is a hoax. It's something 
the Western countries or some countries are building up a story uh, or some corporates are building up a story to sell something uh, or, or ask other countries not to do some things. But all said and done, whatever happens, whether it's man-made disaster or whether it's climate change induced disasters, the poor suffer the most. Uh, and they have nowhere else to go but the dormants. Uh, and therefore, again, I come back and say, the dormant framework is very, very important. So what is the World Bank doing in this uh, context? Um, this is all good to say uh, that the government is not doing things or they're doing certain things. Uh, World Bank is also learning and moving uh, as we move forward. Uh, so the new mantra which came up, uh, I think, last year uh, for any project that the World Bank would design in future should be GRID, G-R-I-D, which is Green, Resilient, Inclusive Development. Uh, the ultimate aim of the World Bank is to uh, eradicate poverty and share growth and prosperity with everyone. So that's the two twin goals that the World, World Bank works with. But any project that's designed um, uh, has to have traditionally looking at social uh, protection measures, environmental protection measures, and uh, gender measures. So as we came to 2015 and after all the uh, international declarations, uh, climate change uh, measures are also added uh, to the World Bank project um, preparation processes. So in 2015, World Bank uh, sort of uh, set a target that 28%, don't ask me how that odd number came up. 28% uh, of all the financing, any country uh, on an average would be uh, sort of targeted to addressing uh, climate growth benefits or climate mitigation strategies, whether it's a watershed project or whether it's urban water project or transportation or energy, so on and so forth. Uh, as a result, uh, World Bank is very good in monitoring uh, whatever it does. Uh, so the climate growth benefits were about 25% in 2015, and it rose to about 60% in 2020. Uh, last year, or early this year, World Bank then up this uh, ambition to earmark at least 35% of its project financing to climate growth benefits or climate uh, risk mitigation measures in, in an average project. It doesn't mean every project should have 35%, but average it should work out with that. Uh, and interestingly, about seven, eight years ago, World Bank also adopted a new instrument uh, for financing. It's called Program for Results, or P4R in short. And this is to promote results-based financing. Oftentimes, even in the World Bank projects prior to 2013, it's investment-based project lending. So you do a project, we know so much water supply lines are being constructed, or so much kilometers of road, or so many hospitals, etc. But we don't know much about are they working? Uh, is the service delivery happening? Uh, so on and so forth. So the results-based approach is moving towards measuring results, not necessarily only inputs and outcomes. So that's a good step, uh, and, the, and the experience is positive. Uh, and and then any World Bank finance, uh, the loan is taken by governments, and they are also learning how to. Uh, move towards results-based uh, monitoring. So that's that's a positive step. And I was involved myself in two such projects, uh, design and implementation, and uh, we find it very interesting process. Uh, coming to India, uh, World Bank has been actively supporting the Indian government, one of the biggest borrowers of the World Bank finance is India, because of its ability to repay and also the need, uh, huge uh, uh, issues to be addressed in India. So there are many projects that are addressing climate change uh, uh, issues. Uh, uh, so for example, the Delhi Metro, 50% uh, of its power uh, is comes from a solar grid that's built in Madhya Pradesh, a distant away, but exclusively for Delhi Metro and about uh, that's funded by World Bank and other private sector partners. So increasingly World Bank is also moving to a situation where it's not the only financer and plus government, any World Bank project government also puts their finance. But trying to bring in other like-minded uh, uh, partners, whether it's other international development agencies or private sector. So in the Delhi project, there are private sector agencies also that came in. Uh, we have uh, recently started some city level projects uh, in Chennai and Shimla. Uh, Chennai is again a big flood prone area like Mumbai, a coastal city and experiencing floods three huge floods in the last uh, six years, five, six years. 
uh, Shimla idea and water supply, sewerage, storm water drainage. These are the projects. Uh, World Bank supported the Clean India uh, program, the Swachh Bharat Mission, the Brahmin rural areas, which has led to near open defecation free status. Uh, then there are projects to look at Danda River Basin to stop the pollutions and build capacities of the cities and states uh, which are feeding into the Danda Basin to uh, build better sewer lines and treatment plants and treatment plants and manage them. Uh, there's dam safety projects. Uh, there are several projects on climate resilient agriculture, including Maharashtra, uh, drought prone areas. How do you build farmers uh, capacities to deal with uh, agriculture in a uh, drought prone or climate resilient countries? So as of today, World Bank is supporting <clears throat> about 127 projects in India, roughly 28 billion. And you add another four or five, four hundred percent, or you know, four times more financing coming from government or private sector or other uh, participating partners. Uh, but what I come back again is to say, strengthening public sector institutions, whether they're agriculture related or urban or you know, uh, water resource departments managing the dams, uh, strengthening these institutions is the and uh, targeting climate co benefits. These two are very uh, big focus areas in any project area. So there's enough attention given, uh, enough support provided, and enough monitoring done on these two issues. And the lessons are scaled up, and that leads to a larger institution strengthening and uh, capacity building. Uh, I also worked with another unit which came up recently, uh, 2030 Water Resources Group, which is part of the World Bank Group, it's co-hosted by them. But it is a public-private civil society partnership platform convened in the World Economic Forum in 2008 to address water security issues globally. The idea is one institute or one sector cannot do alone. So public, private, civil society and academia should come together. It's currently hosted by the World Bank and we are working in 11 countries, including Maharashtra. And the USP is like we help in building uh, multi-stakeholder platforms wherever we work. For example, in Maharashtra, where I'm part of the team, we have developed a, uh, we helped the government to create a multi-stakeholder platform with all the government, public institutions, private sector representatives, civil society, et cetera. And take up projects in a collaborative manner uh, to, to address uh, water security issues. And most of them have climate pro benefits or uh, climate mitigation strategies or resilient uh, related issues. A few outcomes in the short time from 2017 to 2011, uh, 21, uh, so we have public-private civil society partnerships to promote climate smart uh, farming in about uh, 300,000 hectares uh, in irrigated command areas. Uh, wastewater reuse certificates, a new policy uh, mechanism is under discussions, like uh, carbon trading mechanism. Uh, those who uh, we, we details we can get later. Uh, wastewater reuse for agriculture from urban areas. The wastewater uh, that comes out is polluting the groundwater and uh, the agriculture field. So how do you treat it and reuse it in agriculture uh, in, a, in a mutually beneficial manner? Uh, consortium of uh, private sector financing agencies uh, to look at carbon financing and disruptive agriculture technologies. Uh, and pilots are growing on and we are able to creating uh, mobile applications to reach out to farmers with uh, farming advisories digital dashboards uh, to track uh, water resources that are being, uh, either it's groundwater or surface water. Um, you want to bring in other uh, technologies like drones, et cetera, to uh, monitor it. So that's the work we are doing as 2030 Water Resources Group. And any of the participants want to uh, be, uh, this is an open platform, so want to become a member of the platform or know about it, please feel free to contact us. Uh, just want to go back and say uh, planning is important and uh, I had a uh, association with MIT uh, earlier also from 2015 we are working on another World Bank project, supported project in Maharashtra, the Rural Water Supply Project. There we are looking at how do we strengthen the district capacity for district level uh, water planning and uh, Professor James Westport and about 10 uh, uh, master's students, we all worked together uh, and developed a uh, the platform, so it's GS maps, mobile platforms uh, to, to help the state government to adopt an innovative uh, planning approaches. 
and we are trying to get data from multiple sources, uh, including uh, the climate variables uh, at district level and integrate all that into the planning approach. It's not just infrastructure plan, it's a more a sectoral planning approach. So that's the link we have with the uh, MIT and very uh, pleasant uh, memories of work. And we are still continuing this work and our research with uh, Professor Westport uh, uh, and trying to publish uh, some knowledge onto that. So, so I stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions uh, in the next uh, five, five, ten minutes. Thanks a lot for this um, great, great talk. I think we have two questions in the Q and A. Um, uh, shall I stop sharing? Uh, um, as you, as you want. Um, yeah, yeah. I can read the questions if you want. So the first one is whether you think that mitigation and adaptation strategies to flooding that are used in the West are easily translatable to India? Well, that's a difficult question to answer, but some of them is. Uh, I mean, some of the uh, presentation, the speaker before me uh, showcasing the uh, Thailand experience, how do you build uh, spawn cities is another concept. How do you uh, bring in these? Uh, the, the advantage is we uh, have to build now. Uh, so we need not just build concrete infrastructure, but look at uh, more uh, green infrastructure that's building. And uh, the lessons from any city uh, will be useful. But you need capacity to absorb those lessons, uh, adopt them into a planning, change it to the requirement, uh, and then go forward with it. So. It's both yes, uh, but with a caution, uh, what is required for this uh, context is what will be useful. I think we have a second question um, related to this point is, how do these like interventions from international development agencies, how do they interact with the local governments in India? Well, uh, I can speak for myself from the World Bank and 2030 Water Resources Group. So, we, uh, the interactions is mainly through a project. Uh, our technical assistance that we offer need not be a project, but we can work with the governments based on a request and technical assistance to whether to develop a policy framework or a planning framework or a financing instrument, etc. Uh, under the under both the circumstances, once a project is agreed upon, it's usually five to six years. Uh, then we work with, uh, it's, it's a participatory process of developing the project. It's not that we sit in Delhi and we uh, talk to people in Mumbai or Chennai and approve the project. So we have a team of experts for every project uh, that go talk to the communities that project is supposed to be catering to. Uh, it's at village level, city level, district level, uh, talk to the officers, talk to non government organizations. So it's a heavily participatory process which spans around 12 to 18 months. So project doesn't get materialized for a span of two, three months. So that's one arena where we do this local consultations and understand the Latvina and what are the specific areas that the project should be strengthening. While implementation, the governments are responsible for implementing it. Uh, but the World Bank uh, provides um, what we call is we monitor the processes of implementation, not specifically like a finance organization, whether you are done ABC or not. But there also we have a lot of interactions with the local governments and say, uh, what are the difficulties in moving forward? Did you understand this? So we hold watch workshops, uh, thematic um, talk shows, etc. We organize exposure visits to good practices, whether they're in national or international, to learn from these practices. Uh, and come back and start implementing it. It's not that we have written a project document and you bloody well implement it from tomorrow, otherwise we'll cancel the loan. It's not the approach. It's, it's a working together approach. So a lot of opportunities arise. Uh, maybe every four months we keep interacting with some local government or the other, whether it's a small village or a big town or a district level, uh, and understand the problems, work with them to co-create the solutions. And sometimes we change the project um, uh, approaches as required from time to time. So it's not that a project is cast in stone and nothing can be changed. Uh, so, so a lot of these interactions help us. Uh, and that's the uh, process with other international agencies also largely. 
uh, but World Bank spends more time uh, in community consultations, etc. UNICEF, for example, uh, work a lot on uh, wash is issues, water and sanitation issues in India, and highly uh, they also work on a uh, lot of community consultations, uh, promoting uh, exchange visits, so on and so forth. So we find these instruments very, very useful, uh, both for us to learn and for them to also understand what we mean in, in one document, project document. Uh, it's, it's a very learning uh, experience that way. Thank you. I think we have time for one final question. Um, are there any major green infrastructure projects in progress in India? Uh, as I said, I'm not. There are some, mainly uh, the solar projects. A lot of uh, solar projects are coming up. Uh, so that that's which will reduce uh, use of uh, fossil fuels. Hopefully, uh, coal basically for thermal power is the biggest power in India. Um, yeah, and then a lot of projects which are looking at uh, water supply in urban areas to reduce intermittent uh, supply. There, there's a lot of losses, 40 to 50% is the water losses in the large uh, transmission lines and piped water supplies in urban India. Uh, so if you're reducing the losses, you're saving water elsewhere. Uh, so that's climate to benefit uh, green infrastructure. So re refurbishing, uh, renovating uh, water supply pipelines. Uh, some projects are coming up looking at um, septage treatment. A lot of focus and attention is going, which is trying to reduce the pollution loads, etc. cetera. Uh, these are the projects that I know uh, in the sectors that I work with, uh, but I know in the agriculture sector, a lot is happening. Uh, uh, on empowering farmers to adopt uh, more climate friendly, uh, climate resilient approaches uh, and, and then linking them to market. So they also have uh, more incomes in their hands. Uh, there's a lot happening on the transport and urban sectors, as uh, so transport and power sectors. I'm not the right person to comment on that. I don't have much experience on that. Okay. I know it's not, it's not, it doesn't answer you fully, but that's what I can say is happening. But it's still slow, not at the pace that is required. Uh, so you need to still move faster pace. Uh, whether that needs more financing, more capacities, project management capacity is another big issue. Projects that are planned to get completed in three, four years tend to go up to six, seven years, or sometimes eight to 10 years. So how do you make projects uh, and you're able to implement them in time is also very, very important. Uh, that, that's another big thing that uh, is to be built in across all governments, local governments, district governments. Uh, so whether it's for disaster management, climate mitigation planning. So planning, implementation capacity is very, very important uh, put together. Great, well, thanks again for your talk. I think for now, going to our short break and we'll be back at 10.30 for our next talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you all. Bye for now. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, thanks for coming back. Uh, now that we're you know, like here from the break, I'm gonna introduce our next speaker. So this is uh, Catherine Sievit Nordenson is joining us today. Thank you again for coming. Um, she's a professor and director of the Graduate Landscape Architecture Program at the Spitzer School of Architecture, City College of New York. Her work explores adaptation to climate change in urban environments and the novel transformation of landscape restoration practices. She also examines the intersection of political power, environmental activism, and public health, particularly as seen through the design of equitable public space and policy. Her books include Depositions, Roberto Buell Mark, and Public Landscapes Under Dictatorship, Structures of Coastal Resilience, Waterproofing New York, and On the Water, Palisade Bay. Uh, and so with that, I'll pass it over. Great, thank you so much, James. It's been really great to get to know you over email and great to see you um, in Zoom someday, hopefully soon in person, we'll meet. Um, and thank you for this invitation. I love that there's a water summit at MIT and I'm really excited to share a little project with you today that actually is a chapter from a book that was edited by one of your professors. One of the editors is from MIT, Alan Berger and another chapter by another faculty member, Rafi Siegel. So 
Um, shall I go ahead and share my screen? Would that be good yeah, yeah, for go you ahead. all? Take it over. Yeah, and if you'd like, I'll save a few minutes at the end. I hope to take any questions that anyone might have, and I'm not sure how you're fielding them through the webinar. But yeah, everyone, if you want to put them in, there's like a Q and A box. That so would we'll be, keep an eye on it. That would be great. Okay, so I'm gonna find my presentation here and get this up to full screen. Do you see that? Great. Yeah, all good. No worries. I'm going to just minimize me over here on the side. All right. So um, I'm going to speak about a project at Jamaica Bay. We'll, we'll travel down to New York um, for the morning, um, a project called um, Head of Bay Coastal Resilience. And, and I'm speaking specifically about an area of Jamaica Bay. We're looking sort of north along the coast here out of an airplane window at JFK Airport appropriately. So if any of you have ever flown into New York, you've you've gone right over this site. Um, Head of Bay is this zone back here. It's kind of back and around the backside of the airport. It's really where the watershed of the, um, the bay begins. Um, and as mentioned, it's a part of uh, the work that I'm showing today has been incorporated in a chapter in um, this new book, A Blueprint for, Blueprint for Coastal Adaptation by Karen Kowski, Billy Fleming, and your very own Alan Berger. Um, here's Jamaica Bay in the watershed. And I, again, I love that there's a, a, a group specifically at MIT thinking about water and a critical thing is to always consider the scope of watershed. And this dotted line here is basically showing you the territory of New York's five boroughs, um, here just Brooklyn and Queens, where if a raindrop falls, it will land in Jamaica Bay eventually. Everything in here is draining into the bay and then out to the ocean. It's an incredibly large watershed. And it's fascinating also to see this very well-known 1924 aerial photography of the city. It's one of the earliest um, of uh, kind of aerial views that we see the city in this old view of Jamaica Bay pre-airport, no JFK, um, no Floyd Bennett Field, no Belt Parkway, and all of this kind of beautiful dendritic flow of, of water through the sediment in this very murky territory called wetland, which is exactly that. It's not quite land, it's not quite water. Of course, there were many other visions for Jamaica Bay. Over the years, I, I really love this kind of wild one here where the those same marshlands that we saw on the last slide would be canalized and, and channeled and organized in a way to create this new port for the city of New York. And it, indeed this incredible proposal for a canal that would connect the Long Island Sound to the bay for another way of kind of moving goods um, across the landscape through the borough of Queens. Also a kind of nice view of New York we're looking again, from the ocean up toward Manhattan here, and then we see New Jersey beyond. But what I'm really interested in thinking about today, and I think this question of water and where it comes from, what we're gonna do with it, how we're getting more of it from all sides, um, is to think not just about ourselves as, as humans, but of course, those other species. In this case, I'm gonna talk about those wetlands again and how any kind of conversation about retreat could start to be thinking about an advance for other um, non-human entities, in this case, those marsh grasses, Spartina alterniflora. And here we're seeing the existing marshland that's left within the bay today in the watershed. And of course, 2012 Superstorm Sandy, this is the hindcast or the extent of territory that was flooded um, from the surge from that storm, which reached 12 to 15 feet in some areas and how extensive it was in the back bay area. So behind the, the barrier island of the Rockaway Peninsula, which is here. There have been many flood um, control, that's not a term used any longer by the Army Corps, but many Army Corps proposals for risk flood risk management, as it's now termed, since the 1960s, in fact, for the bay. And a very particular one, this is not being fully formed, it's been proposed since the 60s, is to close the bay entirely, to basically seal the edge, draw a hard line at the edge, which creates a binary between wet and dry, uh, and has many, many problems when you're thinking about a watershed where water is both flowing out and in, and that exchange is really critical to both um, let water out of the bay, but also to think about sediment and nourishment coming in from the ocean as well. Again, a photo, uh, map, an early, um, NOAA chart, in fact, this is the early organization of the NOAA organization in 1911, where we see some more of those dendritic um, channels and islands within the back bay uh, and how this starts to be transformed into something radically different. 
again, here's the remaining wetlands. What we really started to focus on in this particular project, which was a collaborative work with uh, Guy Nordensen, who happens to be my husband, but also an MIT grad. Um, he's at Princeton University with my team at City College and uh, working together with, under an NSF grant to really think about this idea of coastal resilience at Jamaica Bay, specifically thinking about this head of Bay Area that I mentioned. And you can see in this existing wetland map that behind the airport, so this big white patch here is JFK Airport. In fact, behind the bay, some of the largest uh, re remaining wetland areas now. So there's actually an incredible exchange in what is called termed the head of bay or where most of the, the watershed is drawing water from. And this is just the same overlaid on that old map where there was so much more marshland, as you can see. And again, JFK Airport, of course, once uh, a vast and extent uh, grassland wetland area. These next slides just show a little bit of this process of inundation over time. This is really just a model showing um, flooding over time. And you can see how the wetland works in, or the, the watershed works in two directions. So waters flow both up and down. So we have to think always about water coming from different sources. And what we saw in Sandy, which produced so much research um, and propositions for how to think about future flood that's of course exacerbated by sea level rise um, is surge thinking, right? So it's always about like that kind of lifting of water elevation through this uplift of the, the storm and the hurricane winds pushing on land. So this is an ocean to land direction, but what's become so much more critical and I think important for us to always think about now is this extreme rainfall that we seem to have every other week, frankly. There are many, many um, historic, really, events with rain coming from the sky. So again, water might be pushing up from the ocean, but it's also coming from our atmosphere to the ground. That produces a push in the other direction. So that in and out that I spoke about at the back bay is really important to remember that we need to have ways for water to both um, not come in or think about how we might think about um, ameliorating some of the pressure of the water coming into these, these um, inlets, but also we need to allow for water to flow out. And the other thing which we see now, which is not so much a flash flood or surge event, is frankly higher tide events. And these are sometimes termed sunny day floods um, in that we see flooding occurring on days when there is no rain, there is no hurricane. It's simply much higher um, tidal periods and particularly these high spring tides which occur twice per month um, with the cycle of the moon. And what we see in the area around the head of Bay in this neighborhood called Meadowmere, which is back behind um, Jamaica Bay uh, and the JFK airport is this amazing change in water level in some of these neighborhoods where you start to see marshland becoming lawn in a way. So these intertidal species like Spartina alterniflora are in fact migrating upland into the water column. They thrive in this zone, which is right between the um, low tide and the mean tide. So in fact, they start to move in advance. And I think this is what's really interesting about plants when we think about um, advancing and retreating is that plants will always seek the right threshold for them to do well. And in fact, as water and sea levels rise and tidal periods become higher, the plants are starting to move into that higher zone. And we actually see this new idea of a different kind of lawn, which in fact is made of intertidal species. So as we look at the kind of rethinking this binary of like, let's close off everything and seal out the water and realizing that's really a, a terrible idea, frankly, in terms of thinking about this back and forth, um, we started to think a lot about like, how could you think about ideas of um, the critical necessity for us to really rethink where people live in a watershed and when are they in harm's way and when is it not tenable to be living within an intertidal um, territory and what could be another way of rethinking that territory such as this idea of the marshes starting to be um, part of that accommodation as sea levels and tides rise with the increased rainfall um, and the risk of surge. 
um, I think this again is just a helpful to helpful to see a kind of timeline of how things changed. It's really kind of extraordinary um, from 1900 to 2021 now, right? So thinking about like there was no airport, this was really just a kind of dendritic marsh system with one rail line moving across it and how that really started to urbanize in the 20th century um, until today when we have this incredibly important piece of critical infrastructure, JFK International Airport. So thinking also in this project was how to think about what can one do um, about protecting the airport, which can't really go away in some ways. So thinking about how that might be part of this conversation to both think about um, creating a way for that to remain uh, a viable piece of infrastructure in the city at the same time, making it part of its neighborhood to protect others around it as well. And to think about how it might coexist with Marsh. Again, I think in this image, you really see this incredible area of uh, wetland that remains in the back part of the bay. And then this, this Marsh Island here called Joko Marsh, in fact, is one of the most robust marsh um, territories within this platform at the back bay. So what we looked at with our proposal was to really think about where is the high ground? So what you're seeing in this yellow line is the 20 foot contour, um, 20 feet above NAV D88 or the, essentially the mean sea level. Um, and we thought about what if you created this connection between high points, so this ridge of the far rockaways here, if we created a way of connecting that to create a new zone um, of protection that might be a more permeable one that allows for this two-way flow of water. So we looked at this double barrier protection system. On the one hand, this outer barrier is a much higher surge barrier that would be about protecting that airport from very extreme surge events, such as a, a Superstorm Sandy. Um, and that was maintaining this 20-foot contour line and essentially connecting it here. Thus, if this were completely closed off, and again, this would not be something we're proposing that should be always closed, it should actually always be open except in these conditions of extreme storm events. This would, in fact, protect all of this territory that's hatched in orange behind. But what we were really interested in thinking about was creating this notion of an, an accepted floodway. So this tidal barrier that we're defining in the pink line here is really essentially a raised street that starts to set another lower datum of 10 feet above the mean tide line um, that would be mapped out on existing streets. But it would start to define a territory of places that were always going to be in that intertidal range, that they would be wet essentially, even at high tides a couple times a month, and spaces that were outside of that. So this was, again, thinking like, how could we allow there to be more flooding that actually starts to engender a conversation about how can we think about retreat in a way that's not just about forcibly displacing people, but starting to think about what is the exchange between this natural system of marshland that wants to move into this area that actually serves an incredible service in mitigating wave energy and reducing the extent of flooding to actually produce more of that marshland while we're starting to think about what areas are going to be wet or dry and then how can we protect an even greater territory in an extreme storm event through the yellow barrier, the surge barrier. And so we use this term floodway here as this area that would be essentially um, a retention area or an allowable place to be wet. And again, to increase the possibilities of more marsh, uh, robust marsh platform being developed. And we looked at many scenarios. I won't go too much in detail into this, but we looked at scenarios across both time and probabilistic floods. Um, but the section is helpful here in that we see there are um, two kind of levels of protection, this outer area, which is generally open, but can start to protect a large territory. Um, inclusive of both JFK Airport, but also those neighborhoods around the airport itself. And then the more permanent um, non-mobile barrier, which is essentially the raised street, street, which starts to define areas that will remain more or less high and dry versus ones that will be in the tidal flow. So the next few images kind of show a little bit of the propositional uh, ideas of what these things might look like. Here we see that storm surge gate open, right? But it becomes also an amenity for the neighborhood where we start to see uh, recreational possibilities that could occur along the top of the berm and the sides of those berms on both the water side and the kind of what's called the urban side. 
um, this blow up section here is essentially what the section along the airport to the bay might look like. So if we imagine this is a berm, but it, it's essentially on land and it would be closed across that airport runway at Joko Marsh and at the opening to the head of bay. And then here we see a little bit more clearly what we're thinking about in terms of the raised street or that sort of lower 10 foot um, elevation street area where on one side we see that houses need to be elevated to allow for this porous movement of water on the bay side, but that marshes, marsh grass can certainly move through that territory. And then the opposite side of the street is starting to indicate territories which would be less likely to be within um, that flood territory. And we have another ele uh, an element that we saw as, an, as uh, elevating an, what's an existing highway, but creating an elevated porous highway so that we could allow the floodwaters to actually move and the tide waters to move below the highway, yet this would always be above any kind of risk, um, flood elevation for evacuation. So just a few thoughts of how we might start to see this much more uh, permeable urban footprint where we can see an acceptance of tidal movement, of, of area to retain and, and uh, actually gather rainwater from above. Um, while pre creating certain levels of protection for those living in the area and for the, the airport itself. And some of the work that we did was looking at these simulations of forcing water through various um, digital models of the bay and its bathymetry before and after this tidal barrier would be in place. And again, you can start to see how this um, connection of the two points of high ground does more than just protect the airport, it actually starts to set up a, a territory where it's protecting indeed the neighborhoods around um, the airport as well. And this image here is a three-dimensional view of what that floodway would look like and the capacity of that territory to actually hold both rainwater from the stream um, events as well as to let um, more kind of movement and passage of tidal waters as well. I'm gonna very quickly flip through a few images of some speculative architectural ideas that we started to think about in one little patch. So if you um, kind of orient yourself here, the airport's a little bit off the screen to the left in this image, but we're looking at a little intersection in Bayswater um, in different, uh, how this area and this neighborhood might start to adapt over time. So an existing condition and looking at these various levels of water rise. So thinking both sectionally about what would have to happen if you were inside or outside of the elevated street. Some things would certainly be re relocated, but many, many uh, businesses and homes could actually just be elevated to accommodate that flow of water. And eventually over time, as we're moving into um, a decade from now or a hundred years from now, you start to see how some of those houses need to actually move out entirely. Um, but some of the speculations we looked at here we're thinking about what were some things that could be done architecturally that also accommodate water um, without creating kind of erasure um, or a need to actually kind of fully retreat from a territory, but actually allowing this interplay between human and non-human um, species to co-mingle. So if you're able, and I'm, I'm happy to share with James the, the chapter after our, our talk as well, but some of the things we were looking at with this proposition was to really think about these goals. Um, how can we strengthen resilience um, and provide actionable strategies that basically engender a public infrastructure system at the watershed scale that starts to combine some of the flood risk management ideas while investing at the same time in ecological health and opportunities for public recreation. We look very specifically in the chapter at some of the policy um, needs that need to be done in order to enable this kind of transformation to occur. These are a few that exist now and we're thinking about how does one start to leverage things like the special coast risk district that city planning has started to create um, that is rethinking how areas that are within flood risk territories are, are built upon or not built upon in the future. Um, but of course, like this notion of, of retreat has, has become a kind of a difficult conversation, but a necessary one. And I think if we start thinking about advance along with the word retreat, we can really start to speculate on futures which can be much more um, amphibious in many ways. So I think that's all I have for the, the presentation, but I'm, I wanted to save a little time if there's conversation or questions. I see a few things are coming up in the chat that I haven't looked yet. So you're welcome to... Uh, 
Yeah, great. Um, thank you so much. That's very, it really does. It fits very well into the theme. I think um, I said this kind of earlier this morning, but uh, we've had sort of a great balance between like looking at some of the science and modeling that goes into um, like understanding uh, how the coastline is going to change with time. And so that now it's sort of great to see some of the applications of, uh, of these new technologies and, and see how we can really like begin to, to think about, well, how are we gonna build our coastlines different in light of that information? Um, so we do have a couple of questions. I'm, I'm sure, can you see the, the questions? Yeah, too? I see feel them, free to, yeah. Feel free yeah. To pick what, let me let me jump into one. Let's see. I, I'd like the this question about coexisting. I think they're all kind of looking at some similar, similar, at least these first two, a couple of similar themes. It's a really interesting question. Yes, humans, particularly at Jamaica Bay, it's very clear that um, we've settled in a very hard way uh, in a place that probably could not handle that kind of weight. So yes, coexist. Can we, I mean, at MA Dink 401, you know, after my own heart. I mean, I really do feel like there's there's a very difficult, um, our capitalist systems have set up a, a way that it's very, very difficult to think about coexistence in a way that's not human dominated for profit. And so I think that there is this elephant in the room of the airport, which is truly um, a monster to grapple with. So I think this is really well spoken. What we were really trying to think about was how could we think about this in a way that's less about that profit-driven model uh, and more about how can we think about what is not defined by a dollar sign, what cannot be accommodated within the Army Corps' cost-benefit analysis, for example. Like what are the co-benefits of um, marshland, right, which are so much more profound than a dollar sign Yes, they mitigate waves, they can reduce the height of waves, they can reduce erosion, but they also provide something that's much more spiritual and unmeasurable in many ways about what it means to be healthy, what it means to be alive, what it means to actually kind of live in a place which, in which you feel a sense of connection to a planet that's not been completely um, monet monetized in a way. And so I think I, I sometimes get really um, you know, unhappy about concepts like ecosystem services, like even that expression, which the core has started to embrace as a way of monetizing the benefits of nature, um, it puts it at the service of humans. And so I think that what's happening in this, this question of balance that you all are looking at in these, these questions, it, it's really helpful to think about like, can we say that nature is in the service of us and shouldn't we be actually working for nature? And so I think what we're really trying to do is open up this idea that we actually need to advance the place of, of non-human species, such as these marshlands, which have been so fragmented and so um, become so vulnerable to our presence and not think so much about like, it's all about the human retreat. It's not at all that, but really thinking about nature's advance in a way. I hope that helps a lot because I know these are really, they're difficult questions. Um, to work with. I'm reading through some of these other ones. Yeah, someone actually has their hand raised. Um, Ooh, I think I can, can give them. Can you speak in this? Yeah, I can give them the opportunity to speak. Oh, awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, Karen. Okay. Hi there. Hi. Um, I was just curious to what extent you were looking at green roofs and um, green infrastructure to help mitigate the floodwaters. Yeah, I think that's that's interesting. I mean, green roofs won't help with a surge, but I think what I described, you know, the rainfall question is huge. And so green roofs would fall into this lar larger category of, um, you know, green infrastructure essentially. So it's everything from bioswales, but anything that starts to capture more of that storm water from the sky, right? And so I think, again, thinking about water, I mean, I love, again, like thinking it's coming at us from the atmosphere and from the ocean, and it's all part of that cycle, that water cycle. Some interesting things about green roofs that I think I, I would put out there, and certainly it's, it's a good strategy to basically slow down just like basically slow down the path of water as it heads to the ocean when it's most damaging when it has that velocity. So it's very, very smart. So thinking about that as a strategy for any kind of large building that has a flat roof is 
really uh, necessary. It's starting to become a local law in our city as well, which is great that that needs to be re retrofitted or new construction actually must meet that, um, that level. But it slows down, it, it deals only with the water coming from the sky and it's slowing things down and starting to absorb and giving also the atmosphere a moment to uplift a little bit of that water again. So it's not, it's going to reduce the total amount of water that will end up um, on the ground and in the earth. Cause I really think there's a question and my kind of critique of green infrastructure that is, um, you know, it's very, it's well considered and well thought but at the same time, there's only so much capacity of absorption of water into the ground that we can handle, especially in an area like this where the water table is very high already. So you can't just keep pumping everything in the water and then hope that nothing floods anymore. There's just this kind of saturation level that is very quickly achieved. And so I think thinking a little bit um, out of the box, again, about how can we get more water back up into the atmosphere in some ways, as opposed to kind of assuming we can put it all back into the ground. I'm, I'm really interested in that kind of exchange again between water, uh, ground and earth. I hope that helped. Catherine, I think we uh, have time for maybe one or two more questions. Okay. Do you want to pick one? <laughs> so let's see. A couple that are coming in. Um, so I, this one is actually kind of this is my question. <laughs> um, so I'm interested. We have, uh, and this has come up again a couple of times, but um, the airport is sort of like a, a static. Um, piece of infrastructure, we can't move it anywhere. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at coastal resilience and planning, like what kinds of, I want to say like, like maybe best practices is too much of a, a glaze over, but like what kind of goes into deciding what things we sort of have to build around and, and they have to stay there versus like, when things can move, yeah I mean I think to like a great great question I'll take that yeah definitely um the issue like I think the interesting thing about these big things out there in our in our urban realm and we could say airport we could also say Amazon fulfillment centers right like these massive things that we kind of need and we kind of depend on and are not being good neighbors basically and so I think what we were trying to look at with this project was how could we task JFK with with doing more than just protecting itself like we don't see this solution as being one in which there's a big wall a flood wall around the airport that somehow accommodates all of the airport but doesn't think about anybody else in its local watershed or even like regional watershed so I think what we really are thinking about and I think this is just like where we need as you know as citizens we need to really push these behemoths um, towards the direction of being more engaged and responsible for the land on which they sit and for the watershed in which they reside and that they have responsibility to all those around who may not have the same kind of access to resources. So what we're really thinking about with this was to think about how does the airport actually start to engage with the communities, many with you know black and brown communities around this airport who have been marginalized for years, yet are huge champions of these wetland parks around their neighborhoods because they know these things are actually kind of of benefit to them and, and they get very upset when the airport, airport cuts down adjacent trees. So I think thinking about how does the airport start to become more neighborly in a way and starting to think about what does it have in the role of this bay and not just its own footprint. I think moving beyond this kind of territorialized ownership model of protection where we see Goldman Sachs surrounded by sandbags right after Sandy and it's light still on, but the rest of the neighborhood black. I mean, those are the kinds of things we're trying to not um, support in many ways. And to really think about like, you know, places of power and places of wealth actually need to start supporting more equitably the regions around them that in fact they're drawing from to survive. Thank you, that's a great answer. It's almost like uh, you kind of do it on the behalf of the entity of the airport. Yeah. Instead of like relying on them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we do have time for another one. Actually, I like to... one. Can I try to grapple with anonymous attendee 1053 AM? <laughs> um, <laughs> how do we wrestle with uncertainty? And I, I love this question about uncertainty. And um, I think, you know, it's something I'm trying to do when I teach is to really think about we don't 
know what the future will bring. There are levels of uncertainty in every kind of projection. There are things we're leaving out. There's things we don't understand. There's unintended consequences to all of this, this world. So I, I feel like this, um, this, uh, this brings us to a kind of place of almost like philosophical peace in a way. Like how do you accept that you cannot control everything and there's there's a level of of uncertainness and certainly um things in the future that we don't know what will come of what we're doing now and if we look at history ever we can see all kinds of you know false missteps and mistakes and good intentions with terrible consequences over and over and so being mindful of the fact that we we also are going to be wrong about many things um, but how can we start to think about not authoring everything to some sort of fixed end, but being a little bit more open, a little bit more um, humble in the way that we approach design and design thinking to think about how we're not necessarily creating solutions, but we're starting to really grapple with some of these problems and, and opening up possibilities that for solutions where we can't, not solutions, but the processes where we can't control the end game in some ways and being open to that and, and setting some things into motion that hopefully will move us in the right direction, but that we can't necessarily control. So I, I, I hope that helps a little bit. I like that question about the, um, the uncertain because we can never be fully sure, but we can start to think about like, what can we start to move in a certain direction and might take another force to continue. Thank you. Um, all things flow. <laughs> things flow, yeah. So, so thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks again for coming today and for giving a great presentation. Um, we're gonna make sure that you know everyone's like details are up on the website too. So um, if you like what you've seen, make sure to go check out some more of Catherine's work. Um, at this point, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Autumn to introduce our next speaker. So thank you again, Catherine. You're welcome. Sorry, I was still sharing the screen. Like, <laughs> very... it's, it's Zoom, I forgot. I'm getting really bad at Zoom, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> Thanks to both of you so much for inviting me. It was really great to, to meet you and see you. Hi, Autumn. All right. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, awesome. So everyone who's on the Coastal Ecosystems 2 panel, I'm going to go ahead and promote you to a panelist. Um, you should get a pop up and then just accept that. Let's see, Chris. Okay. We have Amy and Chris scroll down. There's your your next. And then we're still waiting on uh, Maria Claudia to join, but we're going to get started anyways in the interest of time. Uh, James, can you keep an eye on the panelist side of things? And when you see um, Maria Claudia pop in, just promote her to a panelist. Okay, fantastic. Um, so Amy and Sergio, if you would like, you can turn on your cameras. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and go through everyone's introduction and then we'll start the second portion. Um, so yeah, awesome. So glad to see everyone here today. Okay, can you all see the Coastal Ecosystems 2 panel screen? Okay, fantastic. Awesome. We can get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Autumn Dietrich, and I'm a PhD student in the MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Joint Program. My interest in blue carbon ecosystems began during the summer of 2020 when I worked with Dr. Heidi Neff on a seagrass restoration research project. Now, for my PhD, I'm studying sediment transport in black mangroves. Today, I will be moderating this panel, and I'm really looking forward to a rich discussion with experts in their uh, respective fields. Chris Esposito from the Water Institute of the Gulf. Maria Claudia is the Blue Carbon Director, Conservation International. Amy Schmid from Vera, and Sergio Fagarazzi from Boston University. Um, 
the way that the panel will be structured is that we'll first have each speaker briefly introduce themselves, and then I'll go through a series of questions that will last about 30 to 40 minutes so that we can all learn more about coastal ecosystems, blue carbon, and the blue carbon market. And at the end, you'll all have a chance to ask your own questions. Uh, so we will go in order and start with Chris. Okay, thank you. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can Great. hear you. Great. Uh, well, uh, as Armin said, my name is Chris Esposito, and I am a uh, research scientist at an organization called the Water Institute of the Gulf. And we're a, a nonprofit non applied environmental research organization that's devoted to helping coastal communities and stakeholders and decision makers make uh, well informed, thoughtful, science based uh, decisions. Um, a lot of what I do, and we as an organization have a, a, a pretty broad role. We have a, a lot of different pieces of our organization, but a lot of what I do takes place in uh, landscapes like the one that you see here, where I spend a lot of time looking at the interactions and the exchanges between channels and marshes, uh, in particular in river deltas. So there are a lot of reasons to look at that kind of uh, uh, environment um, for, for contaminants and nutrients and all sorts of uh, constituents in the water, but what I specialize on is the sediment. Uh, and in this context, that's particularly important because in these very low gradient landscapes, the sediment is sort of the necessary ingredient, ingredient and a really important resource um, to be portioned out to offset the effects of uh, relative sea level rise and uh, make these landscapes slightly less vulnerable. If you go to the next slide. Um, so what you saw in the previous slide was um, at least to first glance a pretty pristine looking landscape. But one of the things that I've been doing a lot of recently, and I think it'll work um, really well in the context of what I've heard a lot of the panelists talk about, um, a lot of what I do um, these days is look at ways that you can manipulate this environment. So this is, you know, broadly speaking, a, a very much a, a green infrastructure or an engineering with nature framework. Um, and what you're looking at in the background here are um, a set of constructed terraces and some polygons that will contain vegetation plantings uh, as of next year. And the idea here is going to be how we can use these um, man-made features to sort of augment the existing processes that are going on there and increase the rate of sediment exchange and this rate of sediment capture in, in the target environment that you have. Awesome. Thank you so much for that overview, Chris. Uh, next, we have Amy Schmidt. Hi, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, so I'm Amy Schmidt. I am the manager of Blue Carbon Innovations at Vera. And for a brief introduction, Vera is a nonprofit organization based in the US, um, and we develop and manage standards for environmental and climate change impacts. Um, and the Verified Carbon Standard, or VCS, is um, one of those standards. And it's the world's most widely used voluntary greenhouse gas program. And what this does is that it allows projects to um, validate and verify the greenhouse gas emission reductions and removals associated with their project activity and issues certified um, verified carbon units or VCUs, which can be sold to um, other entities or individuals who are interested in offsetting their carbon footprint. If you go to the next slide. And so one type of activity that can be certified under the VCS program is blue carbon. And so this um, in terms of carbon crediting refers to the restoration and conservation of mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses. And there are a number of different blue carbon methodologies that projects can use to certify and issue carbon credits. So we have um, methodologies available for tidal wetland restoration, tidal wetland conservation, coastal wetland creation, and mangrove reforestation. Um, and that's a very quick introduction to Blue Carbon, and um, I will be excited to kind of speak with the panel on this session. Thank you so much for that introduction, Amy. Uh, and next we have Sergio. Hello, uh, my name is Sergio Fagarazzi, and uh, I'm a professor at Boston University. 
and I'm an expert of uh, uh, geomorphology, how the landscape is changing. And in particular, I focus uh, on the intertidal area, uh, salt marshes, uh, mangroves, uh, uh, tidal flats. And uh, <clears throat> here I, I show you a very famous painting of uh, Heed that is, uh, is uh, located at the National Gallery. And this is, uh, is, is a place where I, I actually am working uh, right now uh, in Massachusetts. And uh, <laughs> I want to stress how this landscape are very important for, for humans and for, uh, for society. And also they were such an important historical uh, legacy, you know, particularly in the United States. Uh, so, how, how these people were painting the landscape, uh, they gave a lot of value to them and uh, we lost a lot of them. Uh, the case of an uh, airport built on uh, salt marshes is very common. Uh, it happens in a lot of uh, countries also in, in where I'm coming from in Venice. And um, so we should also remember that, that there is a aesthetic value in these landscapes. Uh, next. Here I, I show you some of the places where I work. So on the bottom right, you see a salt marsh in uh, Plum Island is exactly where the painting of heat was, uh, was uh, um, located. And uh, here we look how it's deteriorating, how you can lose the border because of uh, erosion, but also how new salt marsh is uh, forming. Uh, on the top left, instead, uh, I show you uh, large scale uh, research uh, project we had uh, in Vietnam at the mouth of the uh, Mekong Delta. And uh, so we were looking at how these uh, mangroves were able to survive or not as a function of uh, sea level rise and sediment fluxes. And at the bottom left, uh, I want to show you other areas that from my point of view, we uh, are not uh, um, stressing uh, we're not considering to, uh, enough. Like we always look at the vegetation component of the system and we never look at the uh, bare um, part, which is uh, very often is flooded, you know? And instead they're linked, you know? So we need to also look there because it, there might be change there happening faster than on the vegetation. So these are the kind of uh, landscapes I study. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm going to quickly check to see if Maria has joined us. I don't believe that I see her and I don't think that my team has seen her yet, but they'll keep watching. So we will just dive into the questions for today. So I wanted to start off with some questions to orient the audience who um, this might be their first time learning about some of these coastal ecosystems. So just a general one that anyone can take. Why are coastal ecosystems important and why should we care about them? Well, they're great subject matter for beautiful paintings as Sergio just showed. Um, I'll, I'll take the first crack. I mean, I mean there's, there's a million reasons. It's a really broad question. So I, you, you can just run down a list of ecosystem services that coastal environments provide, and it would easily take us an hour to, to get through that. Um, I, from you know uh, my own experience, I think this is a lot of people's experience, the, the way that societies interact with them from a planning standpoint is sort of twofold. One, it is from a risk standpoint. So a lot of places, uh, coastal ecosystems, and I, I might be particularly attuned to this because I, so much of my experience is in the, in the Mississippi River Delta. So much of the ecosystem service provided there is a, um, is a, a risk reduction service, so a, 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 a storm surge buffer, if you will. And there are a lot of different components to that, but that's very much a part of the conversation. Um, and you know, from another standpoint, there's the way that people interact with them. There's recreational services. People, you know, take their grandchildren to the beach and fishing and things like that. And that all plays a really important role in society. And that's before, and I won't even talk about the other, that's totally before any of the natural 
natural system services that we're pretty familiar with. But I, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna forget that they do make beautiful paintings. So I think that was a really nice way to start that in all seriousness. Yeah, I also really enjoyed the painting. Amy, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I was going to add, so we focus a lot on kind of climate change mitigation. And so from a, a climate change mitigation perspective, blue carbon ecosystems or coastal wetlands store a lot of carbon compared to other ecosystem types. So I, I think um, there's kind of a, a estimation out there that within coastal ecosystems, there's more carbon stored than in all of the terrestrial forests. But then when you look at the area covered by coastal ecosystems, it's very small compared to the area of terrestrial forests. So just from kind of that carbon storage, carbon sink perspective, they are extremely important. And then that's not even mentioning kind of their um, climate change adaptation benefits that they have. So as Chris mentioned, um, providing some resilience um, for storm surges and for sea level rise. Um, and then also all of the other kind of ecosystem services and environmental benefits that they provide. Sergio, do you have anything else that you would like to add? Uh, yeah, and uh, to me, what is also very interesting uh, is that uh, these um, intertidal ecosystems or coastal ecosystems, uh, they are very adapted to be there. They're very good at getting wet, no? And, uh, and they survive very well, no? So actually we can learn from them. We can learn how to get wet, how to get inundated once in a while. And we can uh, use these strategies uh, in a very smart way that they have also for our uh, infrastructure, for our uh, houses. That is the, the problem of humans now. We build at the shore in a very static and uh, um, very no, uh, dynamic way. And we don't understand that the shoreline is in flux. It, it, it was always like that, even before climate change, even before sea level rise. So we need to learn from these ecosystems how to be more flexible and how to adapt to a natural shoreline that moves. I think that was a great introduction for our audience. And Amy, you already began to kind of touch on this when you mentioned that coastal ecosystems can store more carbon than terrestrial ecosystems in their soils. This kind of leads into one of the main themes of this conversation today, blue carbon. Um, for audience members not familiar with blue carbon, Amy, would you like to elaborate on that a little bit more and orient them to the blue carbon and blue carbon market? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned kind of in my, in my introduction, blue carbon is used to refer to right now restoration and conservation of tidal wetland ecosystems and the carbon stored um, there that can be issued as carbon credits. It's currently being expanded to also refer to other types of ocean-based and marine activities, um, but for the most part we're talking about kind of mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses. Um, and so the way that uh, these blue carbon ecosystems can result in a greenhouse gas benefit is either from restoration of the ecosystem, which will help kind of build up carbon stores and um, increase carbon sequestration um, in restored ecosystems, or it can be through conservation of intact wetland ecosystems. So um, where a tidal wetland is at threat of being degraded or converted, um, addressing that threat appropriately and kind of preventing um, further degradation or conversion of the ecosystem and quantifying the carbon benefit of avoiding the emissions that would have occurred and also the carbon that's continued to be sequestered by the ecosystem remaining. Awesome, thank you so much for that um, definition and description, Amy. Now I'd like to turn to Chris to learn more about um, what role he and his team at the Water Institute of the Gulf play in blue carbon projects. Would you mind elaborating on this, Chris? Yeah, sure. I, so I, again, I'll, I'll sort of hasten to mention that the Water Institute of the Gulf is, is a really broad organization. So we have people there that work um, more on policy and, and people that work more on sort of social impact. Um, I, I'm more of a, a physical scientist, so a lot of what I personally do where it intersects with, with blue carbon is uh, it, it sort of 
help people that are doing restoration projects devise strategies for monitoring the, the carbon impact over the course of the project period. Um, and I, I guess there's some interaction with, with the standard because the standard one defines, you know, what you can count and what you can't count um, to sort of keep, <laughs> keep everybody on the up and up. Um, and it also uh, is, you know, set certain timescales that the carbon needs to be restored by. So when you, when you perform a restoration project and you want to claim a blue carbon credit for it, you need to account for a lot of extra things. And that requires, you know, well put together scientific guidance and, and sort of a little bit of clear headedness at the at the outset of the project. So a lot of what I do is is related to putting together mon models, modeling strategies, or my preference, monitoring strategies to to get those standards actually uh, or to to meet to meet the needs of the standards that they might be. Um, I, I actually am curious on this because uh, it's maybe something that Amy can answer, but there's a lot of, um, to my understanding, um, uncertainty in how these projects are going to be counted because they're relatively new. So we've, you know, we've been doing some work on, on, on a, a, a project that is going to try to claim some blue carbon. And I guess there's, um, and I'm getting a little bit outside of my expertise here, but there's some question about what market might be the appropriate one to claim it on, um, the extent to which markets will be mandatory in the future, and there, there aren't any right now. And I, there, there's just a lot of really interesting uncertainties that need to interact with the science and the, and the monitoring at some point. Um, and I, one other thing that I'll mention is that a lot of, um, a lot of states, so there's, you know, there's already sort of a national carbon inventory, but a lot of states seem to be getting on board with this um, and constructing their own carbon inventories and their carbon plans. I'm actually not 100% sure if that counts as blue carbon, um, which has a, a specific standard, or if these are just carbon inventories, which is somehow separate from blue carbon, but a lot of the focus is on coastal environments there. and. Um, all of that requires a lot of monitoring and a lot of thinking about how the environment is going to respond to change over the next several decades. And that's sort of where I personally fit in. Thank you so much, Chris. And as you alluded to in your conversation, Amy might be able to shed a little bit more light on this topic. So Amy, a question for you. How does Vera set these rules standards to ensure that projects are legitimate and sequestering blue carbon in, in that whole process? Yeah, so that's a that's a really good question, and that's kind of the whole reason why we're here is to make sure that when someone is buying a carbon credit and using it to offset their emissions, that it's representing you know a real and measurable emission reduction or removal that's happening that wouldn't have happened under kind of a base or a business as usual scenario. So a lot of what we do is we um, base our rules and requirements off of scientific research and the understanding of ecosystems. Um, so blue carbon is, is relatively new in terms of kind of carbon market activities. I think it was maybe 10 years ago that the term was coined and that um, different groups started to do research into the real carbon benefits in order to be able to have kind of a, a greenhouse gas methodology. Um, and then also as more information is learned, we'll update our standards to make sure that it's reflecting kind of the most up-to-date as possible um, information about different activity types. And in terms of um, something that Chris mentioned around kind of different carbon markets and um, states doing their own carbon inventories. So one thing for carbon credits that they have to represent is that they're emission reductions or removals compared to kind of this business as usual scenario or baseline scenario. And so oftentimes if you're looking at a carbon stock inventory, that's how much carbon is, is present within the ecosystem or within a certain area. Um, but it doesn't necessarily represent the amount of carbon that would be emitted to the atmosphere or that has been sequestered by these kind of new activities. And so that's kind of an important distinction that for a project issuing carbon credits, they need to be able to show that they're having this real kind of additional benefit beyond what would happen without carbon finance. Thank you so much, Amy. 
Uh, it looks like Maria has just joined. Uh, Maria, we're so happy to have you on the panel today. Um, Maria, would you mind introducing yourself briefly and what you do at Conservation International? And then I have a question for you right away that kind of spins off of um, what Amy just said and how your organization has actually worked with Vera. Hey, hello, Adam and, and everyone. I'm so sorry. I had a pretty bad internet problem this morning and I was not able to join before. So sorry about that. And, and if my sound is not working correctly, please let me know because I'm having these problems today. So um, my name is Maria Claudia Diaz Granados. I'm working in, I, I'm working in Conservation International. I'm actually the Blue Carbon Director and I'm based in Colombia, South America. And I've been uh, leading the uh, Blue Carbon uh, project we have developed in uh, the Colombian Caribbean coast. And it was uh, recently um, approved by VERA. We use the uh, wetland module. And it's, as far as I know, it's the first one that uses that methodology and it was uh, certified and approved by VERA. So we are really happy uh, to have um, that certification. We are right now um, implementing the activities in the, in the area uh, and at the same time selling the credits in the international voluntary market and um, working on the expansion process of that project. Thank you so much, Maria. I have a quick uh, follow-up question and then we'll pivot to uh, Sergio next. So, because this, these blue carbon projects and blue carbon uh, market is relatively new, I know that the project that you worked on Colombia is one of the first uh, major blue carbon projects. And during a conversation that we had to prepare for this panel, you had mentioned that there is a big difference between just a blue carbon restoration project and a blue carbon um, project that you want to end up being able to sell the credits on the blue carbon market. Can you share what, how those processes differ um, in getting those projects off the ground. So, um, well, I think that, that, that those are two um, parts of a similar project. You, you have to basically have the project ongoing in the, in, the, in the area, in the field. And on top of that, you can also value the carbon service. And, and with that, uh, you are able to get financial support to continue the activities you are already doing in the project itself to guarantee the, the mangrove conservation in this case or restoration or natural regeneration. So it's, having this um, certification basically will allow you to have a small amount of money, but over a large period of time. Uh, it doesn't mean that you will be able to cover the entire finding needs because it's obvi obviously depend on the um, cost or the value that you will receive by selling those credit in the, in the, in the international market or in the, inside the regulated national market that depends on where you are working on. In our case, we are selling them internationally uh, because that's the way we, we, we will be able or we are able uh, to receive more funds per credit sold. But at the same time, you are, we are already working in the, in the areas. We are still receiving um, international cooperation funds as well as um, um, funds coming from um, environmental compensations or other sources of revenues that are important uh, to maintain this project. So this is a mixed funding strategy and one piece of that is uh, obviously the blue carbon credits. I'm not sure if I'm responding to your question. You know, that was perfect. That was exactly what I was getting at. So thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Uh, so now I'm going to pivot to Sergio. Um, so you have a different perspective. You're in the academic um, area at Boston uh, University. So what coastal ecosystem projects are you currently working on? And what does the research process look like for you? Yeah, so uh, we have a large uh, project in Virginia in which we look uh, at how the um, salt marsh is expanding 
in forest and also in uh, agricultural fields. So because the level is rising, uh, a lot of forest uh, are experiencing dieback and a lot of uh, crops are also becoming very salty and they need to be abandoned and the marsh is expanding there. So we're looking at how the soil is changing, uh, how the, hydrolo the hydrology and the soil uh, are changing as a function uh, of this expansion. And in particular, we focus also on carbon and uh, we're gonna, we want to see if uh, the carbon dynamics are different in this new marsh, it's gonna be a new marsh. So we want to know if uh, we can store the same amount of carbon we want to know um, if uh, we lose uh, carbon because of the forest biomass uh, that we are losing. So this one is one project. Then another project is uh, down in the uh, Mississippi Delta and uh, it's in collaboration with the NASA. And uh, we are using uh, new remote sensing data to look at the dynamics uh, of the white lines. So uh, NASA is, uh, is launching uh, uh, new satellites that are gonna be able to monitor these wetlands, but in very particular ways. So we need then to add on top of uh, this uh, remote sensing data, our expertise, our models to be able to uh, understand the, the fate. So this, the goal is to understand whether these wetlands are gonna survive or not in the future. So, uh, most of my research is about uh, um, wetlands formation and uh, wetland erosion. And this is what is very important for all of us. We need to understand that these wetlands are dynamic. They're not, they, they don't stay there. They move around, they, they change, they, conti they continually change. Wetland, we need to think about wetland as a, also a carbon. So when I, I see a wetland, we need also to see the carbon inside the wetland. So even if you do a restoration project or a, a, a blue carbon project, those wetlands are gonna change, particularly now that sea level is rising. So we always to understand that, that these systems are very dynamic and what we, we do now might not be there anymore in 20, 30 years, even a restoration. Okay, great. That was, that was so interesting um, to hear about your projects that you're currently working on. Now I'd like to um, pivot back to Chris. And this kind of will tie into then a question for um, Maria Claudia. So Chris, you mentioned that the Water Institute is um, designed to help decision makers and communities make intelligent decisions for the uncertain future. How can engaging stakeholders and decision makers in blue carbon projects have a positive impact on like the execution and longevity of projects? Yeah, thank you. Um... It's, it's, it's actually harder than it, um, than it sounds because if I sort of just write a report and send it out, it either gets read or it doesn't and either gets implemented in that way or it doesn't. And it's, it's not always a clear line from uh, sort of understanding um, in a scientific sense to execution in a, in a way that is, that is consistent with that or even if it is consistent with that, meaningful. Um, so I, one, um, one thing that I, I've been working on a lot recently is trying to develop locations where um, uh, restoration stakeholders or decision makers and people that research those systems can actually plan projects together. Um, and I, I guess the sort of tagline that I, I always use is that I, I, if I write a proposal to NSF or something like that, I'm not gonna be able to fund a bulldozer, right? Um, so there's not going to be a way for me to actually manipulate the landscape, but there are a lot of places in um, in a lot of coastal landscapes where the landscape is being manipulated very much, and it, it, you really get a lot of bang for your buck from a researcher standpoint to situate yourself in the midst of that restoration because you can actually plan somewhat controlled experiments using those resources. And then from the other perspective, from the people that are actually doing the restoration, um, they often understand the environment that they are restoring very clearly, um, but they don't have the mandate to do controlled experimentation that's going to improve their practice the next time over. So there's a really good synergy that can be achieved by, um, by, by situating those two kinds of work together in space, like together in the same location, and also by really facilitating close interactions 
between the researchers and the, and the practitioners. So that slide that I showed at the beginning that had the terraces with the flow coming through it, um, I, I don't know if it was clear, but there's a little monitoring platform right in front of that. And that whole area is right now being developed by the Water Institute as a place where this sort of somewhat experimental restoration practice can take place at a landscape scale. So you don't really have to rely on some numerical models for, for hypothetical landscape configurations. You can actually, to some extent, achieve them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, so now I'd like to ask uh, Maria a follow-up question. So Maria, you had mentioned that part of um, working and planning these blue carbon restoration projects, you need to engage uh, the local community. Uh, can you give us some examples of how this was done in uh, Colombia on the project that you worked on? Yeah, sure. Um, that is a very important question. When, when you work with these coastal ecosystems, usually um, they are inhabited by coastal communities, rural communities, and they are using or depending on uh, the services those ecosystems provide. So that's why when you want to start any kind of project, you need to include them from the very beginning into the planning process, as well as uh, including them in designing these project um, processes as well. In the case of, of Colombia, the areas where we are working at are also declared as protected by the environmental authority in those two geographical um, states or municipalities. And, and when you do that, uh, communities need to be part of the uh, management plan implementation, and they, need, they also need to approve um, the, um, the process, every single process that is gonna be done within the area because they are also living there. And that's why I believe that in, in, uh, in some of the cases, uh, and especially with coastal ecosystems, you should uh, include communities from the very beginning. It is a different situation if you are working in a terrestrial forest or a private land where you don't have uh, these um, public or um, indigenous communities. So it's, it, it will bias. In our case, it was um, very important for us have them from the very beginning. They used to have a, an, a, a kind of agreement with the um, environmental authority for them to use the wood of the mangrove is the only area where this is allowed. So they can uh, selectively log mangroves and use them and sell them as part of their cultural uh, activities. And that has been approved by the government, but only following a very strict monitoring uh, process. And that's why they were part of this initial project design. And, uh, and they were also, um, they are also actively working with, that, with us, not only monitoring the fauna, the flora component, but also all the fauna associated to that environment. Thank you, Maria. I think, I think now everyone has a good idea of how stakeholders can be engaged in these projects and the importance of doing so. So I have a final question for um, both Amy and Sergio, and then uh, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. So we focus a lot on blue carbon thus far in the conversation, but at the beginning, um, Chris had mentioned there are so many ecosystem services, uh, not just ones associated with uh, carbon storage in these coastal ecosystems. So Amy, and again, in a conversation that we had to prepare for this session, you mentioned that blue carbon credits are only accounting for carbon sequestration and not other ecosystem services. Um, how are you and your colleagues at Vera working to include this into the cost of a, of a credit that would count like um, damping um, waves, uh, protecting coastal communities from storm surges, et cetera? Yeah, so um, whenever a carbon credit is issued, it's just that. It's just representing kind of the carbon or greenhouse gas benefit. But as we all know, there's quite a few other really important ecosystem services that these activities provide. So there's a few different ways that this can kind of be incorporated into a carbon project. So the first is there are other types of certification um, certifications out there. 
for projects to certify their benefits to local communities, biodiversity, or um, kind of verify claims of contributions to the sustainable development goals. And so these can be added on to a carbon credit um, and associated with it when it's sold. And then in terms of kind of the, the price of a carbon credit, that's not something that Vera sets, that's between a project and a buyer. And so um, depending on how much the buyer is willing to pay, that can you know, drive up the price of the carbon credit. And so what we've heard is that either projects with kind of those additional certifications of their community biodiversity or SDG benefits, um, that they can get higher prices because of that, or that projects that kind of have this really kind of um, interesting story about their benefits and their kind of other um, benefits to the area other than carbon can also get a higher price. So generally we see that, um, or that we've heard that buyers are willing to pay more for blue carbon credits. And then there's also the potential for um, kind of other ecosystem services to be associated with a credit. Um, that could be another source of finance to the project. So um, one kind of idea about this is for coastal resilience um, and quantifying the benefit that especially mangroves provide um, and being able to sell that as a separate type of credit to a carbon credit. Um, and then we've also heard interest in kind of quantifying like water quality benefits um, as well for these types of activities. Thank you, Amy. And then uh, Sergio, have you focused on any um, projects with coastal ecosystems where the focus hasn't been just on, you know, blue carbon or carbon storage? Uh, projects on blue carbon, could, could you repeat? Oh yeah, have you worked on projects that weren't focused on blue carbon, but were focused on still coastal ecosystems? Yeah, 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 actually the, so the, the blue carbon is a very small component of my project. Um, I usually team up with the uh, blue carbon people. Uh, so I mostly look actually at the evolution of coastal ecosystems uh, from a morphological viewpoint. So like sediments, you know? So uh, I worked in uh, Vietnam uh, at the, on the Mekong, on the mangroves of the, uh, uh, in the Mekong uh, Delta, for example. And we were looking at how the mangroves are, are eroding or are expanding as a function of, of uh, supply of, of sediment. And we had very interesting results. Um, we, we saw that the, the, the link, the, so it's very dynamic, it's linked to the, to the environment. You know? Like if I change uh, substrate, if I change uh, what material I bring to the shore, the mangroves will change. Then uh, I worked uh, in, uh, so I'm, I'm from uh, Venice, Italy. So I had a project also in Venice. Uh, there we have, uh, we lost most of the wetlands uh, historically, uh, not because of uh, human intervention, but naturally. And we think this was a, a reduction of supply of sediment. So um, uh, now we are trying to, uh, they're trying to mitigate this loss by adding uh, uh, protection around the wetlands. I work also in uh, Plum Island uh, in Massachusetts uh, where the painting uh, of the heat uh, uh, was, uh, was drawn. And uh, there uh, we are looking at the effect of sea level rise uh, on uh, the vegetation of the marsh. So all the, the, uh, the, these uh, systems are very dynamic. The vegetation is, is able to find uh, its own zone. But then if you change something, you, know, you, you can have a, a difference is like uh, 10 centimeters. And the grass of the marsh is completely different. It's shocking and it happens very fast. So what we're gonna see in the future is not like a loss of marshes, like in, except in Mississippi, because Mississippi has a different problem because it's also sinking. But in other parts of America, what we're gonna see is not a loss of the marsh, it's a change in vegetation. Okay, great. So that brings us to the end of uh, my questions for the panel. Uh, thank you all for your very detailed and insightful answers. Now we're going to pivot to some Q&A from the audience. Um, audience members can type their questions in the Q&A um, box. 
You can also raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can ask your question live if you'd rather. So we have uh, one question so far. Um, has media coverage or public opinion influenced your work at all? Are there things you wish more people knew about your field? And anyone can take that to start off. We can um, look at this. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say maybe I can start with this. So, um, in terms of kind of media coverage around carbon credits, I feel like usually it's very high level kind of basic information, or it's starting to get into some of the um, criticisms of carbon offsetting. And so, I one of the things that I wish that um, people knew better, understood better is kind of the purpose of carbon offsetting and how it's how it's used. So I like to think of it as kind of one tool in our toolbox for addressing the climate crisis. It's not going to fully address it. It's, um, you know, intended to be kind of a, a thing that companies can use when they can't um, reduce their emissions right now. Um, and so it's, it's almost this like short term um, tool to be able to help us get closer to addressing the climate crisis in the short term. Um, and then also that it is still a really important way to get finance to some of these important projects that otherwise would not have um, the financing available. Thank you, Amy. Does anyone else uh, want to add on to the question? If not, I also have uh, some questions to wrap everything up. I can say something about the uh, uh, services, no? What for me is very surprising is uh, that people do understand the services provided by these ecosystems, but they don't understand how much of each service is provided. For example, there were people in uh, New York that thought that a small march of like uh, 20 meters in front of their house would protect them against uh, of a hurricane. And instead, uh, no, we, we fail somehow, or we don't even know ourselves how to communicate how much this service is. No? For example, we need to have maybe 20 kilometers of marshes to protect against a surge. No? And that, in my point of view, is a bit, uh, it worries me because then people might be very, might get very uh, bad surprises. No? They think, oh, what happened here? Like, uh, wasn't the marsh supposed to protect protect me? Wasn't the marsh supposed to reduce erosion? Uh, because we failed to communicate them how much are these services. Thank you, Sergio. Um, if no one else has something to add, oh, Maria, you have something. Uh, yes, perhaps I, I can add something again about the um, media coverage or public opinion affecting the, the work or influencing it. Uh, in, in, in the case of our project, um, we have had a lot of uh, media coverage. I have to say, globally speaking, but in terms of the country, uh, we have received a lot of um, good and bad um, influence from this um, public opinion, because in some cases, um, the information is not um fully um developed or is not fully socialized and that may create uh difficulties internal difficulties because they say they say usually they they want to to um share a big news and sometimes this is not exactly what is happening in the ground and that perhaps may affect uh the activities or the project itself so uh, it, it is very important to be very careful how you are uh, socializing uh, these processes and and what what is the audience you are trying to um, connect or contact using these um, media um, opinions. Yeah, I, I think I, I've had probably a similar experience that you know a lot of the product and I, I'm not in project implementation. I think in the way that Maria is but uh, you know a lot of the experience that i've had you know has to do with the fact that 
a lot of large scale restoration projects are extraordinarily expensive and, and they're really leveraging huge amounts of resources to make major changes in people's environments. So, you know, when you balance all of the interests that are going into, into that project, you, you do have to be a little bit aware that the, the, the answers aren't really cut and dry. You know, you as a scientist aren't going to find a formula that's going to to you know optimize the benefits to everyone who's concerned in it. And there's a, a deeper um, conversation that goes on within a society about how to actually how and where and when to actually implement these these things. So um, so that's that's kind of been my experience as well. Thank in that conversation, course. I just want to be clear, I, I, I might not have been totally clear on it, but that that's sort of informed by science, but beyond the science. That's a totally, that's not entirely, a, you know, it's a science informed conversation, but it's not a scientific output. Got it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so we have a question in the um, Q&A from uh, Loretta Roberson. Loretta was on the um, Coastal Ecosystems One panel yesterday. So thanks for your question, Loretta. She asked, have any panelists worked on projects that use seaweeds or regenerative aquaculture for carbon credits? And if not, can they comment on the likelihood of that happening? Um, well, I can start off here. So we don't have any of those projects um, under our programs yet, but it's something that we're looking into. We see it as a potentially large opportunity um, for kind of marine and ocean-based activities to be covered with carbon credits. Um, I think before we get to the point where, um, you know, a, a project could be developed and actually issue carbon credits, there's a lot of um, open questions that would need to be answered. So additional research needing to be done on the rates of carbon storage and depending on what you're doing, um, you know, how much carbon is kind of ending up in different carbon pools within the ocean, how do you monitor that, um, et cetera. So uh, from our perspective, it's really interesting and a potentially big opportunity, um, but we think it's at least a little ways off because of some of the open research questions that would need to be answered and, and really have a better understanding of some of like the greenhouse gas dynamics before a greenhouse gas methodology could be developed. Thank you, Amy. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to add anything? I am curious um, and I'm going to put you on the spot, Amy. So you you mentioned the open research questions. Um, do you have a favorite? <laughs> um, so I think some of the things that are on my mind are um, if just kind of where does the carbon end up and how much ends up there. So a lot of the interest that we've heard about with seaweed aquaculture is either sinking seaweed for the purpose of earning carbon credits or from seaweed farms where the seaweed is being used for another purpose like harvested and used that still a certain amount will end up in kind of these like very deep sea storage areas almost where they'll remain for a long period of time and so you know some of our questions is like well where is it ending up how much is ending up there um, versus how much is being kind of like uh, used by ocean organisms. And then if you're sinking seaweed, you know, what's the impact on the deep sea ecosystem where it's ending up? Um, yeah, it could be substantial, <laughs> potentially. That, that, that's really interesting. I, so from my own experience, I've, I've, I've really come across trying to do these calculations in two different environments. The first is in an eroding um, salt marsh, right? And then we tried to tease out and didn't really come to a, 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 a satisfying answer, but what happens to the carbon that gets eroded, um, it, it's important to track and it's not totally clear where that ends up. So what we ended up doing, and I think that we're probably gonna do this for the, 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 the blue carbon calculation, but I'm not the final decision maker on that. Um, I think we'll probably count it as a total loss because we can't really track it as, as being retained anywhere. Um, that's probably the safe thing to do. It's honestly probably the best thing to do, but it's something where we really ran up against a, a substantial scientific uncertainty. And then the other 
environment is in, um, I didn't talk about them specifically, but a lot of the restoration effort in Louisiana has to do with these river diversions where you're diverting portions of the river to actually grow new land. And for even forgetting about calling it blue carbon there, but just accounting for carbon in those environments and, and figuring out a monitoring strategy that will partition out the, the you know, the local growth for us that's a lot less carbon is, is I'll simply say difficult, <laughs> um, but also really relevant to any accounting strategy. Thank you, uh, Chris and Amy, uh, for your responses. So to tie things up, I have a final um, question for Maria and a final question for Sergio, and then we'll officially end this panel. Um, so Maria, we briefly talked about this when we spoke to prepare for this panel, but what do you think the future will hold for blue carbon projects in the blue carbon market? Um, what do you think of the future of this? Well, um, there is a growing interest from companies to buy these blue carbon credits. I think that they are, globally speaking, we are a little bit behind that uh, growing demand of projects. We still need to uh, have uh, projects ready to be um, to offer, uh, to be presented and verified, obviously and also be ready to sell those credits. Uh, we are trying to move it, to move fast, as faster and as fast as we can, not only um, on our side, like uh, as Conservation International, but I know that there are a lot of uh, other organizations that are interested in uh, promoting or developing this project, um, like more in, in different geographies, not only focus on mangrove seagrass and salt marsh conservation but also restoration projects but again i think we um the demand is moving very, like very fast so quickly we are not um at this moment ready to offer those um the volume of credits they are looking for and we need to be to innovate a little bit more uh, not only by like selling the um, carbon credits, so, so not only looking at the carbon component of those ecosystems, but also trying to invent or create other sources, other ways of um, funding mechanisms, valuing different services, because carbon is not the only one. And those ecosystems are really, really important for uh, human well-being, food security, etc. So we, we should be focusing on not only on carbon, but having a, a more uh, holistic approach approach, and um, offer uh, not only carbon project, but also tied to co-benefits and other um, services that are very important for those type of projects. Thank you, Maria. And then uh, Sergio, a uh, question for you. So we've had a great discussion about coastal ecosystems. What are some things that you would want people to walk away um, from today's panel with? Uh, yeah, this, this idea, um, I repeat myself, but this idea that uh, the shoreline is uh, dynamic. Uh, every configuration we are gonna establish, natural or uh, artificial, is gonna change. Uh, so we need to understand that, that this is a landscape that is changing in uh, years with or without climate change. So whatever we do in, uh, at the shoreline, uh, if you want to restore ecosystem, if you want to um, get blue carbon credits, if you want to protect the infrastructure, it's gonna change. That is very important. So we need to think in terms of a dynamic system and uh, uh, in continuous evolution. Thank you. And that brings us uh, to the end of our panel. I want to give a, a virtual round of applause uh, to all of our panelists for being here today. I really enjoyed the discussion and I'm sure that the participants, uh, the attendees did as well. So with that, we're going to take a break and we'll get started back up at 1.30 on the webinar. So the webinar will be closed um, for the next hour and a half, but we'll get started back up here. 
uh, for Brian Davis's talk at 1.30. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.